Okay, hello everyone. So, I am going to give a bit of a one month update on our Wolf and Physics project, which launched uh, on um, April 14th. And um, actually, today is a double anniversary, uh, semi anniversary, whatever the, the, um, uh, the right term is, because it's also the 18th anniversary of the publication of my big book, A New Kind of Science. See, I even have, there's the prop there. Um, and uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, where things are at with the physics project and also kind of the path from New Kind of Science to the physics project and so on. Um, it's, uh, I started thinking about what has now become this physics project about 30 years ago, I had uh, worked on kind of um, um, uh, particle physics, cosmology, things like that back up until about 40 years ago, um, stopped to start creating things like Mathematica. And uh, then about 30 years ago, started uh, working on what became new kind of science and uh, the, the real thrust of new kind of science is explore the computational universe, um, find out um, um, what's, uh, um, uh, find out what one can do with kind of the computational paradigm applied to science. Kind of the, the concept is we, we have this idea that we represent things in terms of computation, that we make uh, models in terms of programs and so on. Um, how can we use that how can we explore that basic science and how can we use that to, uh, to study uh, other questions in science? And um, I thought I was just going to discover a few things, but um, when I started working on what became New Kind of Science book back in 1991, discovered lots of stuff. And in the end, it took a decade to work through the things that became that book. Now, a lot of that book has to do with the sort of abstract question of, when you look at simple programs out in the computational universe of all possible programs, what do they typically do? And trying to sort of build a science from that. Another part of the book has to do with applying what one learns from that to particular areas in physics, biology, mathematics, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the use cases in that book was applying these kind of computational ideas to fundamental physics and to try to make a fundamental model of the physical world. Um, and I spent altogether about 100 pages out of the 1,200 pages or so in the book uh, talking about the fundamental theory of physics um, and figured out lots of interesting things about how to use networks as the foundation of something underneath space and time and so on. Got a fair distance uh, for reasons that I explained in kind of the backstory post that I made uh, a month ago, um, kind of stopped working on that and didn't restart it again until last fall, um, when we really started working in earnest on the physics project, uh, uh, on our Wolfram physics project, um, and just made a, a vastly more discoveries than I ever expected. But let me talk a little bit about the arc of new kind of science and, and how that's played out. Because um, the, the kind of the, the backstory of new kind of science has been a story of kind of how is science done? And, for about 300 years, there was this kind of big idea in science, let's use mathematical equations and kind of the language of mathematics to represent what happens in the world and let's figure things out based on mathematical equations. That was kind of the Galileo-Newton tradition of, of science that uh, got very successfully applied in physics, um, got uh, uh, attempted to be applied in lots of areas from economics to uh, to mathematical biology and, and, and lots of other places. But, but for a solid 300 years, kind of the big idea in how to do exact science was given something in the world, write down an equation to represent what it does and then go and do your best to solve that at those equations. And um, the, uh, the, the real point of my uh, new kind of science book was to sort of uh, launch a new kind of science that both that sort of would base itself on something different from that tradition of mathematical equations. And in particular would base itself on the sort of fundamental idea of computation and the idea that one can just have programs in the computational universe 
that represent as models things in, in the world. And as I said, I think the, the intellectual core of a new kind of science is really the, the study of the computational universe for its own sake as a piece of basic science. What do those simple programs do? The big surprise, uh, particularly my sort of favorite flagship example, Rule 30, is even though the rules for the program may be very simple, the behavior of the program need not be simple. It can be, in fact, as it turns out, as complicated as anything. And the, when one looks at sort of the basic science of the computational universe, probably the, the, the single core idea that I think is sort of the unifying principle is what I call the principle of computational equivalence. The idea that even though the rules for a system might be simple, the system is capable of computation as sophisticated as any other system. And that kind of explains the ubiquity of universal computation. It also has all kinds of implications like this idea of computational irreducibility, which I think is a very important idea that uh, we'll see a lot more of in, in the years to come. And it will be more of a feature of the world, more of something that we have to kind of uh, come to terms with and make use of than, uh, than it has been so far. But computational irreducibility is just this idea that even though you may know the rules by which some system operates, actually working out what the system does may be something that is kind of computationally irreducibly hard so that it's necessary to basically actually follow each step in the computation to find out what the system does. You can't kind of jump ahead and say, oh, the answer is going to be this much more sort of computationally efficiently than the system itself. Now, you know, that idea of computational irreducibility is kind of at odds with the, the tradition of uh, the, the hoped for tradition of mathematical science, where it's just like, right now, once we've written down the equation that governs things, then we're kind of done. You know, we just have to solve the equation and then it's all, it's all worked out. Computational irreducibility says, even though you may know the rules by which the system operates, it's still the case that you might have to do an irreducible amount of computational work to see what the system actually does. So one of the questions from, from New Kind of Science um, is uh, sort of what happened to the intellectual ideas that I sort of launched in that book? And the answer is, they've gone great. I mean, the, the, uh, this idea that you can use programs instead of mathematical equations as a way to kind of uh, model the world, the natural world, the social world, whatever else, this is just something that is now routinely done. And for people interested in the history of science, it is a, uh, a, a, a charming but absolutely repeatable, you know, almost predictable kind of feature that when new ideas are introduced, people at first say, well, they usually say two things. They usually say either can't be right or it's been done before. Sometimes they say both of those things are true. So, uh, you know, it, it, um, I have to say that when New Kind of Science came out, um, there was uh, plenty of, of excitement in lots of different areas and plenty of early application of, of, of the ideas. But there was sort of a, a certain uh, view that kind of this, oh, you know, science doesn't really need something new and different. This idea of sort of basing models on programs is a little bit sort of improper. You know, a real model should be based on a mathematical equation not on something as sort of mechanistic as a program. It's kind of ironic that back in the time of Newton, uh, he had to fight the battle of, no, 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 the model doesn't have to be mechanistic. It can just be an equation. 300 years goes by and uh, one's got the opposite battle of, no, 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 uh, you know, to have a program that actually has steps is too mechanistic for a model. But the thing that's happened and been, been very interesting to see is, and I kind of, I think in the, in the preface to New Kind of Science, I pretty much said that was what was going to happen. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of tempted to go look at the preface to New Kind of Science. I'm, this is, I'm going to get myself in trouble doing this, but I'm going to, I'm going to see what, um, uh, what I actually said, because I don't remember, because it was 18 years ago. Um, I think, uh, um, let's see. Uh, it's, um, yeah, okay. I, I talk about the fact that... Um, um, uh, there are lots of applications of uh, the foundations in the book. There's lots of applications, both conceptual and practical, that can now be developed. No doubt some will come quickly, but most will probably take decades to emerge. 
Um, yet in time, I expect that the ideas of this book will come to pervade not only science and technology, but also many areas of general thinking. And with this, its methods will eventually become a standard part of education, much as mathematics is today. And in the end, most of what now seems surprising and remarkable in the book will come to seem familiar and commonplace and so on. But um, uh, so in fact, it's kind of interesting that that's, that's I, I hadn't read those words in probably 18 years. So, so um, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, what I expected was going to happen was that these things that were initially kind of seemed like, how can this possibly be true? Why, why is this possibly, you know, how can this possibly be relevant to things will eventually come to seem kind of commonplace. And I think what, what we've seen over the last 18 years is this kind of progression from, uh, to, uh, from, a, from a, a, a time when mathematical equations were the only sort of real way to make models of things to a time when, when new models are constructed for things, um, they are most often constructed these days in terms not of equations, but in terms of programs. So that's, that's I think, been an important kind of uh, conceptual uh, thing that's happened um, over, over the last 18 years. I think the other part of it that I think I can see really gaining momentum now is the understanding of the sort of really conceptual uh, things like the principle of computational equivalence, the idea of computational irreducibility, and so on. These are things which I think increasingly uh, people are, are understanding as sort of uh, 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 common features of the way one thinks about things. I, I've, been, I've been pleased to see that uh, like the idea of computational irreducibility, which is I think, uh, well, if, if we look back 300 years to sort of the origins of mathematical traditions in science, um, uh, there are sort of concepts that emerged like uh, momentum, you know, was a concept that emerged at that time or force. Um, the sort of the modern analog of that are these computational ideas like computational irreducibility. Um, and uh, uh, it's interesting to see how those are sort of pervading our, our everyday thinking about the way things work and, and how we should think about AI ethics or how we should uh, think about the, the types of things that we can do in technology and so on. So anyway, that, that, that's, um, that's been an interesting progression to see. But in my big book, New Kind of Science, one of the use cases, as I mentioned, that I wanted to have for these ideas about um, uh, sort of the computational universe of possible programs is, what about our actual physical universe? Could that be an example of one of these simple programs to be found in the computational universe? As I mentioned, for a long time, that idea languished, but last fall, particularly um, uh, as a result of um, my two young collaborators, Jonathan Gorard and Max Piskanoff, um, we, this got reactivated and um, uh, uh, we really started to dig into this um, question of, of could we really use the ideas that were in New Kind of Science book about um, things below space and time that might be based on uh, uh, things like networks or, or more recently based on some other idea that I had, uh, these kind of collections of elements and relations that can be represented as hypergraphs. So, the thing that, um, that happened was, well, we started last fall doing this, and by golly, we discovered uh, all kinds of things, and it really worked out just great. And um, the, uh, uh, the result of that was that uh, a month ago, we launched um, our Orphan Physics project um, and uh, described a bunch of uh, kind of how we think uh, physics actually works. And I can talk a little bit about that, but I want to talk a bit about what's been happening since then. So, so you know, it's kind of the, the challenge is, uh, can we, uh, okay, so the fact that we can really discuss in kind of, uh, in, in sort of, in, in a unified way, how does physics work, leverages what's happened in particularly 20th century physics. You know, back, if we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, and we say, can we explain how physics works? Well, there are all these different phenomena. There's light, there's, there's electricity, there's, um, uh, there's uh, things about gravity, there's all these different ideas, there's, um, uh, there's the way that matter works and so on. All of these were disparate threads of, uh, of development in physics. But what happened in 20th century physics was that those threads kind of uh, came together into, into basically two big lumps. Uh, quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, 
and general relativity, quantum mechanics to describe sort of matter and, um, and things like electromagnetism and all the things around that, and general relativity to describe gravity. Now, those two lumps were, have not been sort of successfully merged. There was lots of effort, particularly starting in the 1980s, um, to try to, to really uh, bring those together and lots of apparent inconsistencies between them and so on. Um, but uh, uh, an awful lot had been figured out about the way, not, not why physics works the way it does, but a, a way of describing, for example, with the standard model of particle physics, a way of saying, look, if you can say it's an SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, you know, local gauge invariant theory with Lorentz invariants and this and that and the other, then that's, that's sort of corralling together a huge number of different physical phenomena which, which have been observed. So in a sense, what, what we had to do was connect uh, so this sort of low level uh, kind of um, representation, computational representation to what was already known in 20th century physics. What's known in 20th century physics is technically complicated. You know, I had the big advantage that I used to do that stuff for a living, so to speak. So, so it's, it's um, and I learned it when I was pretty young. So it all seems kind of obvious to me in some sense. And uh, the, the, so we have 20th century physics. Now, can we explain what's going on there from something much lower level? And that's the big surprise that from these models that are based on just simple elements, relations, hypergraphs, all these kinds of things, that we can uh, understand how those core ideas of 20th century physics, particularly general relativity and quantum mechanics arise. So the other big surprise in this project has been, what about computational irreducibility? Why are we not dragged down by computational irreducibility? We start from these very simple models, these very simple things where we're just looking at, at rewrites of hypergraphs and so on. We've just got these networks. We might grow it to you know, a billion uh, elements in the network. And uh, like, how do we know what's going to happen? How do we know that this is going to be like 20th century physics? How do we know that it's going to make something like our universe? So I must say that I had been quite pessimistic when we kind of were getting into this last fall that it was gonna be a, a very, very, very long ride to get to the point where we could start to make contact with what's known in physics. Um, but the big surprise, which I already knew some parts of from, from the work I did in, in New Kind of Science 20 years ago or so, but the big surprise was that a lot more than I expected turns out to be generic. It turns out it doesn't actually matter that what the precise details of those hypergraph rewritings are, you still get certain phenomena. Now, after the fact, I think this is unsurprising, but you know, it, it's, a, it's the nature of figuring things out that um, what, uh, what at first you know, is very hard for one to reach later comes to seem like it's totally obvious and one should have known that all along. But um, the particular point here is that one of the things we know about the universe is that we notice regularities in it. The universe does not seem to be sort of arbitrarily, irreducibly complicated. The universe seems to be ordered and organized in all kinds of ways. And that fact should tell us that there's some layer of computational reducibility that sits on top of whatever potential computational irreducibility might lie at sort of the core of how the universe works. So it turns out that 20th century physics is essentially a description of a couple of kinds of computational reducibility that sit on top of, um, on top of sort of a, a layer of computational irreducibility. Um, and uh, the, the two big directions there are sort of the computational reducibility that turns into general relativity um, and the computational reducibility that turns into quantum mechanics. And so what's happened over the last month? I think for me, the most important things that have happened are a progressive understanding of uh, really what in detail, how those correspondences work. We, we knew mathematically how sort of the correspondence with general relativity work that was pretty much known at, at the time of NKS. Um, we, we sort of uh, knowing how the mathematical correspondence with quantum mechanics works, uh, we sort of know, but, but I've sort of been making, I think, good conceptual progress in, in understanding and sort of wrapping my arms around really what does this mean. Um, another important thing that's sort of come up 
is the correspondence with the distribu distributed computing and the realization that a lot of what we're doing in physics has direct mapping into questions about distributed computing. Why is that important from a conceptual point of view? The reason it's important is the whole reason we're able to do this project is because we have intuition based on doing about how computation works, based on doing computation. This project, I think, would not have been possible had it not been for the fact that, for example, I've spent, you know, a, a, well, really long time, 45 years or something, actually doing computational kinds of things. And so that, that's something that um, uh, has helped build intuition that lets one have a hope of being able to sort of think about how the universe might work computationally. Well, similarly, we're now understanding this correspondence between these ideas about, uh, about general relativity and about quantum mechanics and the ideas about distributed computing. Distributed computing is a difficult area. It's an area that has traditionally been very hard to wrap one's, one's brain around, so to speak. And what I think is gonna happen is that we're going to find from these ideas from physics, from the things which were discovered in 20th century physics, we're gonna be able to apply those ideas to have sort of a new way to think about programming in distributed computing. And okay, that's nice. It's very useful for distributed computing, but in terms of basic science, what that will do is then give us experience in ways of thinking which relate directly to the science. And that's, I think, going to be the way that we actually end up sort of really being able to leverage the, um, uh, what, what's being figured out scientifically here. Well, another thing that's, that's, um, that's happened is uh, uh, lots of people have been interested in getting involved in this project. It's really great, really great. Um, I would say that the, uh, the sort of the big demographic picture is um, we're seeing, uh, well, we're seeing a lot of interest by a lot of people, um, a lot of people really starting to work on things around the project to try to connect it to existing ideas in physics, in mathematics, in computer science. Um, we have our summer school coming up in uh, uh, around uh, the, the last week. It starts the last week in June. And by the way, I uh, um, encourage anybody who's, who's relevant to, uh, to apply to our summer school. I think it's going to be a terrific group of people. Um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really cool because I think it's going to be the case that in this, in what we have now opened up with this direction in physics, there is a lot of low hanging fruit and there will be a lot of classic papers to be written, so to speak, about how this sort of new paradigm for thinking about physics relates to a lot of existing questions in physics and a lot of um, sort of uh, uh, new questions in, in, in physics and, and, and in other areas that are, that are opened up. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, both what happens at the summer school and the consequences of the summer school for kind of the history of this, this direction in science. Um, but uh, so, you know, what I think we're, we're seeing is um, the uh, uh, lots of enthusiasm. I think the, um, uh, it's kind of interesting to, uh, I, I, I should be, I'm, I'm sort of at this point, a, um, I wouldn't call myself jaded. I don't like to think of myself as jaded, but I'm at least an experienced uh, person when it comes to the introduction of kind of, uh, you know, paradigm shifty types of, uh, uh, types of ideas. And so I don't, um, um, I don't uh, take it too seriously or personally, some of the things that happen in that process. Um, but uh, uh, I would say that I have to say, I think that things with this project and this set of ideas are off to just a fantastic start. I mean, if I compare them with the sort of pattern of various kinds of, of paradigm shifts that I've seen, uh, we're off to a, a terrific start one month out. So, you know, I might, I might ask the question, um, the, um, uh, might talk a little bit about um, sort of big things we've learned and why wasn't this project done before? What did we need to know that, what do we know now that if we'd known it 50 years ago, it would have made things a lot better? And I think there are two main things that, that, um, uh, that really I've come to understand. Um, one of them I understood before a month ago, one of them I've really understood only in the last few weeks. And, and there are two things which I think were sort of, if I, if I might say, if, you know, if I might pick sort of a wrong, wrong turns in the history of physics. Um, the most important one was the idea that space and time are the same kind of thing. And that was an idea that 
really emerged with the, with the it was a mathematical packaging of, general, of, of special relativity that led to that. It's like special relativity is really easy to represent when you think about four vectors and you think about Lorentz transformations, there are these matrices acting on four vectors. It's just like space and time really look like they're the same kind of thing. They're, they're packaged together mathematically. Well, when we think about things computationally, time is a very different thing. It's all related to computational irreducibility. It's all related to kind of the inexorable progression of one step in, in, in the system to the next. And it's not something that really looks like space. Space in our models is this, just this hypergraph structure. And it is, you know, you go from one part of the hypergraph to another, and that's what space is. And it's really different from time. Now it turns out that the causal graph that represents the relationship between things in different places in space uh, over the course of time, that causal graph has all the right properties to give one special relativity, for example. And so there's nothing as an emergent feature, space-time emerges just fine. It's an emergent thing. But what you start with is time is a very different thing from space. And in the in the way that physics, mathematical sort of approach to physics was formulated, those two things were packaged together. And that made it very hard for somebody like me. You know, it's like X mu, okay, it's a four vector, represents position and, you know, everything works in terms of X mu. And it's very, very convenient to think about that. Um, it just turns out to be misleading, I think. So that, that's one thing that I think was sort of a, that was a 1909-ish, uh, I would argue sort of, uh, uh, it's interesting because it was a mistake of, of mathematical elegance, which I'm a great fan of, sort of being, being used to package the way that one thinks about things. So the second mistake that I've only realized much more recently um, was made in the 1920s and 1930s, and it's a mistake in quantum mechanics. And the mistake is in quantum mechanics, you're always talking about quantum amplitudes. And a quantum amplitude you learn is a complex number and quantum amplitudes have certain properties. You add them together, you take the, the modulus squared to get probabilities, all those kinds of things. Okay, so one of the things that was done in quantum amplitudes is that you, know, you have this, this number and it has a magnitude and it has a phase. And those two things were packaged together. It's just one complex number and everything I'd always thought all my life, so to speak, I'd thought quantum mechanics is represented in terms of quantum amplitudes, which are complex numbers, okay? Well, I think what we've realized recently is it's the wrong thing to package them together like that. Actually, a quantum amplitude should be thought of as a magnitude and a phase separately because they actually come from different places. So in our models, there's this notion of multi-way systems of saying there are many possible ways that this uh, rewriting of the hypergraph could occur. There's a whole sort of graph of possibilities, this multi-way graph of possibilities of, of the different things that can happen. And uh, we can discuss which, uh, and, and, the, and the, the question of how many different ways you can get to a particular outcome, the path weighting, the path counting, that is the magnitude of the quantum amplitude of the thing you get to. So if you, if you, if you reach a particular, so, so all the different points that you can get to in this multi-way graph um, are, are, correspond to different quantum states. And the question of, of what the magnitude of the amplitude is for a particular quantum state is determined by the weighting of paths, the number of paths that reach, that get to that particular quantum state. Okay, what about the phase? Well, the phase comes about because one is looking at, so we have this notion of branchial space. So there's ordinary space, space we know, physical space where we move from place A to place B and so on. There's also this notion of branchial space when there are all these branches of the multi-way system that correspond to essentially all the different quantum possibilities. You can, you can have a notion of branchial space, which is the space of all these branches. You're laying out all these quantum degrees of freedom, all these quantum states. You're laying them out in some kind of space. Now that space isn't, it's not like three-dimensional or something like our ordinary physical space. It's it's probably exponential dimensional. It's a much more complicated thing, but it's a space and you can just imagine laying out all these quantum states in that space. Okay, the phase of those quantum states is essentially their position in that space. And essentially what's happening is 
as you uh, have, you know, you have a GD set, you have a a, um, a propagation of um, uh, through this multiway graph of sort of what's happening in the universe, and that propagating GD sick that turns as it goes through this multiway graph, it's it's turning in branchial space, and so in a sense, what's happening is that the phase of um, the um, uh, the, the, the phase of the amplitude is associated with essentially the turning in branchial space or the position you end up in branchial space. So, so you're kind of separating out those two things which had been packaged together. Now, once you separate those two things out, for example, it becomes very unremarkable that the path integral of quantum mechanics, the Feynman path integral, uh, which is just e to the i s over h bar, it's just a pure phase. And that's the weighting of each path. And that's that's the thing that is telling you about the, the sort of turning in branchial space as opposed to something else, which is the counting of paths, essentially the measure in the path integral that is, is, uh, is telling you how to count paths to where you're going to. So it's, um, it, it's sort of this, um, the, once, once you separate those two things out, um, it becomes, it's not yet completely clear to me, but it becomes a lot clearer how quantum mechanics works. So when it comes to thinking about quantum measurement, we have this notion of quantum observation frames. So when you're dealing with space-time and you want to say, how do you tell what happened in the universe? We imagine that there is some observer who puts down some way of them understanding the universe. So for example, they might say, um, I'm gonna describe these events as being happening simultaneously. I'm gonna define my time coordinates this way. And there's some arbitrariness in how you define your time coordinates you might do it differently. So for example, if you're moving at a certain speed, as in an, in a, you, you might define an inertial frame in standard special relativity, which is sort of tipped in space time, so to speak, relative to what you would do if you were not moving at that, uh, at that speed. So the, um, the, the, way that, um, the way that you're sort of uh, understanding the world is in terms of this re these reference frames, which describe how you sort of coordinateize, how you represent what your understanding of space and time, what your understanding of extent in the hypergraph and progression through uh, through the evolution of the system, what those are, that's that's how you are understanding space time. Okay, so the thing to realize is in the quantum world, there's a similar kind of need to understand things. And we have this notion of quantum observation frames, which are essentially a way of, of uh, slicing uh, uh, this multi-way graph is there's progressive sort of computational evolution that happens as this multiway graph is formed. Um, and that, that progressive computation uh, is, uh, plays the role of time, but how you specifically define time depends on sort of what your quantum observation frame is. And what we sort of understood is that measurements, typical quantum measurements involve picking specific quantum observation frames. And so for example, uh, things one can think about are when, when you're picking that quantum observation frame, you might, uh, in branchial space, you might be sampling some, some set of quantum states that are over here in branchial space. Um, and you might sample also your, your quantum observation frame has to wind its way through. If it wants to, to consider two different, if it wants to sort of look at a measurement which involves sort of two different um, uh, quantum states, it, it has to kind of wind its way through branchial space to get to the other quantum state that it's considering. But here's the, the critical point. The critical point is that there is a certain uh, definition from sort of the causal dependence of different events in the multiway graph that determines what quantum observation frames are possible. You can't, just like in space time, there are only certain kinds of, of, of frames that work if you have a frame that uh, takes, well, where you say, this is my definition of time, but my definition of time kind of folds back on itself so that there's a, a place in space where there are two different times assigned to it. That's not a valid possible foliation of space time. That's not a valid possible way to, uh, to define times. And the same kinds of things happens with quantum observation frames. And that's sort of what determines uh, when you start making measurements, there, there are only certain ways that you can wind your quantum observation frame through branch hill space. And that's kind of where the meat of kind of quantum measurement comes from. 
So another thing I've understood is uh, when people say, okay, uh, you know, how can you, you know, what predictions does your model make? How can you know your model is correct? Well, here's a, here's a thing I realized. It's sort of a, a, a conceptual validation step for a model like this. So the first thing you can do is just say, okay, I can show that in certain mathematical limits, the model produces the Feynman path integral, the model produces Einstein's equations, those kinds of things. But let's get more operational about it. Let's say that we could essentially compile uh, 20th century physics into our model. Okay, so our model is, is a new machine code for the universe, effectively. It's a lower level machine code than we've ever known before. But the question is, can we take what exists and just do a compilation step into that lower level machine code? And what we're realizing is that yes, that is going to be possible. And not only is it possible, it's actually a pretty good framework for doing even computations that people have wanted to do before in the framework of standard 20th century physics. So in general relativity, one of the things when people look at like, let's say black hole mergers, a big part of that is doing numerical relativity, solving Einstein's equations in, uh, by numerical approximation. It's a difficult business. It's a very difficult business because of all the sort of uh, freedom associated with space and time and how you define it and so on. And so what we realized, actually it turns out there was a note in the NKS book about this, but I'd completely forgotten about it, um, is that you can use this idea of causal graphs that are sort of a core idea of our models to actually make a practical way of doing numerical relativity. And so Jonathan right now is, is, uh, is working on just that, of, of making, um, taking sort of codes for general relativity and actually making them work uh, using causal graphs as their underpinning. And so that, that will give one, it's like, okay, you think you're doing, you know, solving black hole merger stuff using some complicated code. Well, actually that code is living on top of a machine code that is one of our models. Um, it's very much analogous to what I did many years ago in the 1980s with fluid dynamics, where I was able to take the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow and show that they could live on top of, in that case, a, a fake uh, sort of machine code that was some simple cellular automata that represent idealized molecular dynamics. Now, the really remarkable thing is that we think we've got the actual machine code. We don't know, we don't know the exact instruction set, but we think we have the, the structure of the, of the actual machine code for, for the universe. So, so that's a, um, uh, so this is kind of a, a proof by compilation, so to speak, that you, know, you take the actual computation of black hole mergers and show that when you root them in terms of causal graphs that can be built from our models, that you get the same thing that you would have got from uh, that these kind of converged in in how models work between our kind of new much lower level machine code and the kind of uh, and the existing ideas of of basing things on Einstein's equations, which is sort of a much higher level of description. So that's that's in that case. Now, what about quantum mechanics? Well, same deal. Um, I think that the the first thing is to take quantum information, quantum circuits, quantum computing. And uh, basically, we happen to have been developing a quantum computing system for Wolfram language. Conveniently enough, over the last few years, that's been being done. And so we have representations of all of these quantum gates and quantum circuits and quantum measurement operations and so on as, a, as symbolic things. And we know that the symbolic representation we have uh, can compute things in the same way that anybody else computes things in quantum mechanics. But now, the thing that we're trying to do is to basically write a compiler that simply takes those representations of quantum gates and so on and compiles them to multi-way systems. So essentially we're compiling to the very low level machine code that we have for the universe, um, the sort of existing ideas about quantum mechanics. And that's again, it's sort of a proof by compilation and it, it's obviously gonna work. That one is even more obviously gonna work than the general relativity one, which will also is also kind of obviously going to work. Um, so that's so that's pretty interesting because that's kind of a different way. It's not what one usually thinks of as as, um, uh, as it's a very operationalized way. And and by the way, when we do that, we'll actually have a really pretty good way to implement uh, quantum uh, quantum computation simulation of quantum computation on a computer. And also, it will show us a bunch of things about the actual foundations of quantum computation. 
and what's possible and what's not possible. Because for example, in our model, we end up with essentially micro measurements. We end up being able to break down the process of measurement into these micro steps in a way that really hasn't been possible before. And the traditional treatment of measurement in quantum mechanics, it's kind of, well, you do all this quantum stuff and then boom, you do a measurement. Whereas we've got sort of the understanding of how that, how that is, is created from, from elementary pieces. So, so that's one thing. So there's another thing which um, is more embryonic, but um, it's again, a sort of proof by compilation, so to speak. So in quantum field theory, one is used to doing, uh, one, one would love to be able to do kind of numerical simulation of quantum field theory. It's been really difficult. And most commonly it's done after doing a so-called Wick rotation, which takes ordinary space time and makes time imaginary and so on. Um, and uh, that leads to things like lattice gauge theories. Well, our representation of the Feynman path integral in terms of uh, what happens in our multi-way causal graph and so on, um, that suggests a way of doing essentially numerical quantum field theory. Haven't really done it yet. Um, hopefully that will be a project that gets done in the next uh, month or two, um, at least get started to see how we can do numerical quantum field theory and how we can actually sort of have a practical scheme for doing that using, using our kind of models. So anyway, those are, those are um, the sort of this proof by compilation, I think is a, is a, is a sort of a, a somewhat new conceptual approach in terms of, of sort of understanding the relationship of models and so on. There's another piece to this, which I would say is, is um, uh, we're slowly starting to understand, which is there's a lot of important development that's been done in mathematical physics, particularly in the last 25 years or so, um, lots of things. Um, and it seems like a bunch of the ideas that um, those develops in, developments in mathematical physics um, have a lot to say about what we've been doing, and we have a lot to say about those things. And we're sort of trying to bring those together. And we just started doing some uh, live stream discussions with uh, outside folks who are interested and in, uh, have worked on uh, these particular directions. We did one with Jim Gates and his Adinkras ideas. We'll be doing one next week with uh, Faye Dauka about causal sets. Um, and we expect to do a bunch more of these, um, concentrating on different, um, uh, different kinds of um, uh, developments in mathematical physics and how they relate to, to what we're doing. Um, you know, there's a, another thing that we've sort of slowly understood. A lot of the kind of the most abstract parts of mathematical physics seem to play um, on, seem to sort of uh, read on the kinds of things that we're doing. So one area is category theory, um, which is something I've always been a little bit afraid of. And I think I, my poll of mathematicians suggests that there are mathematicians who like it very much and there are mathematicians who are afraid of it. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, for somebody like me, who's, who's been interested in kind of the, the, um, the abstraction of things in terms of symbolic expressions and things like that, I shouldn't be afraid of category theory, so I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to get to that point. But what we realized a week or two ago is that um, uh, there are ideas in particularly higher category theory, higher order category theory, that are, actually do seem closely related to what we're doing. So in particular, category theory is all about um, thinking about these uh, morphisms that are kind of this um, sort of maps to this, maps to this, maps to this, and so on. It's kind of making a graph. It's making a graph with certain special properties of uh, certain kinds of transitivity and so on, but it's basically making a graph. When you, uh, when you make a higher order category, what you're doing essentially is, is you're saying, uh, you know, my, my first order is just, I've got a thing and it maps to a thing, it maps to a thing, it maps to a thing. Then you're saying, let's take those mappings and let's map the mappings to other mappings. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, the second order category idea is let's map the mappings to each other. Well, turns out that that's exactly what we're doing when we look at a causal graph. So we might have a, a um, something where uh, sort of a, a, a state is being transformed to another state. But then what we're asking when we make a causal graph is what is the relationship between those transformations? What's the relationship between different transformations? Which transformations, which, which acts of transformation are causally dependent on which other acts of transformation? So that's kind of like making a second order um, uh, category uh, setup. Although we're, you know, in our sense, 
you know, category theory, you're often saying, well, this is a particular mathematical object. This is another kind of mathematical object. Those are the things that occur in your commutative diagram or your other uh, sort of um, uh, category theory thing. Um, but for us, it's kind of uh, categories in bulk because we're, you know, we're dealing with, oh, there might be 10 to the 100 uh, of these, of these uh, elements, these nodes essentially in this, in this diagram. So it's a little bit of a different, it's sort of a use of the, it's a, it's a more, categor, more categorical than category theory. It's using the infrastructure of category theory, but not so much of the, the uh, assigning meanings. It's kind of like, in a sense, what's, what we've done in our models in general, and what embarrassingly took me a, an outrageous number of years to figure out, um, is in, in Wolfram language and in its predecessor SMP, what I had done is to represent everything in terms of symbolic expressions and the whole operation of the language involves transformations between symbolic expressions. Well, in fact, our model for the universe is just like that, except that the symbolic expressions that we're using there are very uh, are, are meaningless symbolic expressions. So normally in Wolfram language, we might have a symbolic expression that's you know plus of times or whatever, whatever, whatever. And we've got these, these things with meaning like plus and times, but there's nevertheless a purely structural way of thinking about symbolic expressions and the abstract transformation of symbolic expressions independent of meaning. And it turns out that that's essentially exactly what we're using in the end to represent our uh, elements and relations in, in this underlying model of physics. But it's sort of embarrassing that that was something that took me uh, an outrageous number of decades to realize that you could disembody kind of the, um, the structure of symbolic transformations from the meaning of symbolic transformation. So we're sort of doing the same kind of thing with category theory here, but we're saying, forget what any of this stuff means, just take the structure. So the thing to realize is that the, that the sort of the, the level of, of, of um, uh, so our ordinary, like a multi-way graph is sort of one level. And then the next level, the next higher order is to look at causal graphs. And then we can look at higher order after that as well. We can say, let's look at, given those causal edges, given that, then we can ask, what's the relationship between causal edges? What does that mean? What's the next order sort of uh, a higher order category? What is that? Well, what that is, is that is our foliations. That's when we take our uh, causal graph and we say, what are the things which are together? What things should be related in the causal graph? What, what edges in the causal graph should be, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the nodes in the causal graph are um, uh, uh, correspond to the edges in, um, in the original multi-way graph. And now we're asking the question, the edges in the causal graph, how should they be related? And we can start thinking about those edges in the causal graph being related and, and building up essentially a representation of the foliations that correspond to our sort of slicing our reference frames and so on. So I think sort of the third order category story has to do with reference frames. And then there's a question as we go up to the infinite categories and the things like the, the infinity groupoid and so on, what do these mean? Is there some, what is the, what is the meaning of sort of the higher order, uh, you know, once you have reference frames, then you have equivalence classes of reference frames. What do those mean? And I don't, don't yet know the answer, but this is kind of a, um, uh, sort of that's, a, that's another direction. I, I might say that I think, I, I mentioned the analogy with distributed computing. I think the sort of a key piece of that whole story is, what's a reasonable reference frame to use to understand what's going on in a distributed system? So in, in general relativity and special relativity, uh, it starts with special relativity, one's interested just in these inertial frames. We're just understanding the causality in the universe by just saying we're either stationary or we're traveling without force um, at a certain velocity. Those are our inertial frames. Now, when we get to general relativity, we have slightly more elaborate frames that we might consider. But the question is, when you are doing, let's say you're doing distributed computing and you've got a million processors that are connected by some network and, and uh, they're all doing things and you're sending messages between them and so on. And you can ask, what is the reference frame that, uh, and all these things are uh, doing their operations and they have certain causal dependencies. This processor can't do anything until this other processor has done something. So those causal dependencies um, define certain possible, possible ways that you can foliate um, the, 
the kind of quote space time, except it's not space anymore. It's sort of processor space and time. So then the question is what, uh, what are the possible, what are some reasonable reference frames to use? We don't know yet. We don't have a calculus of reference frames. It's just not something that's developed. It's sort of a meta level of something like general relativity, which hasn't really developed. I mean, it, it, it feels a little bit like topology. Topology is sort of a meta level of geometry that doesn't talk about the details of how you ge geometrically represent things, but it talks about the big picture of that. And it's kind of a, you know, what we need is something that is like that, but it's, it says more things than topology says, and it talks about the things we need in these reference frames and the things, the ways that we need to resolve partial orders um, into total orders to make, to make uh, foliations and successive reference frames and so on. So anyway, there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of a, uh, you know, this is sort of my emerging understanding is, you know, a big issue is the calculus of reference frames. Maybe it's related to, you know, third order category theory. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think it's going to be something which is sort of a language design problem where, you know, where we want to get some way to really think about that kind of distributed computing. And having got that, I'm fully expecting that once one programs in that, one will get intuition for how those things work, that will be directly applicable back into physics. Now, I might say, uh, so one of the things that, that's sort of come up is the purely, uh, well, uh, we're sort of slowly understanding different directions in, in, uh, in what's happening in physics with, with our models and so on. I would say that there are a number of frontiers, many frontiers actually. Uh, so one example is the better understanding of black holes, event horizons, singularities in space time and so on. And actually this has sort of led, we've, we've done a number of live streams on this. And one of the questions, one of the very practical questions is how do we actually present what we're figuring out? So we've, we're doing live streams, we're doing tweets that summarize some of those live streams. Uh, we kind of had the idea of what we're calling bulletins we, we so far have zero bulletins published, but, but um, uh, hopefully that will change soon. And kind of the notion is there's sort of a tradition in academic science that, you know, you, you write these papers which are a bit desiccated and they just sort of explain what's going on, but they, they need some, to be a good paper, I, at least my principle about papers back when I used to write them 40 years ago was, you know, they, they, um, you know, they should be complete. They should say what they say, tie it in a bow, there's not a lot more to say about that subject, as opposed to just like, well, this is what I figured out today. And it's kind of more of a, a discussion about where we are and where, where we have not got and so on. If you look back to the early days of scientific journals in the 1600s and so on, you know, the early proceedings of the Royal Society, okay, they happen to be written in Latin, which makes it more difficult, not impossible for somebody like me, but, but more difficult to absorb, but, but they, they transitioned to English at some point. And you can see the kinds of things that are discussed there and they're a lot chattier than what you're used to seeing. And they're a lot more, well, we figured this out, but then uh, you know, the chicken died and we couldn't figure that out or, or whatever else it is. Um, and uh, I think the, um, uh, you know, the, the translation of that statement into modern desiccated um, uh, scientific papers would be, I think, amusing if you back translated it. But anyway, the, the, um, uh, the point is what we, what we want to do is to put out these bulletins, which are a little bit more kind of human in a sense and describe what we figured out, what we haven't figured out and uh, sort of make progressive, uh, uh, progressively make progress and so on. Um, the, um, so actually the first of these bulletins I've been working on, uh, which I thought was gonna be trivial, but of course it isn't, is about black holes, event horizons, singularities in space time. And I think what's pretty interesting is that it's possible to see uh, a, a bunch of the the standard results of general relativity about what happens in, um, about the kinds of things that can happen with event horizons and so on in the context of our models, um, it's possible to see them rather, rather much more straightforwardly than in the traditional continuum equations type of approach. But also there are new things that get suggested. And um, so uh, one of the things, you know, in general relativity, you can say, well, at the center of a black hole, uh, like a, a, a spherical black hole, a Schwarzschild black hole, for example, at the center of the black hole, well, there's a singularity. And at that singularity, you know, you can describe it a variety of ways. You know, the curvature goes to infinity, time is of limited duration, whatever. But fundamentally, the Einstein equations don't really tell you what happens there. They don't really apply. So you can just say, well, we've got this space-time, this manifold, and it's got a little tiny hole punched out of it. 
and that's all we say. Right? In our models, we don't get that freedom. We don't get to say, oh, well, our model applies almost everywhere, but there's this little tentacle that can hang out, that's hanging out where the model doesn't apply. So this notion of, you know, we can sort of cut a piece out of space time, can't do that. We have to actually explain what's going on there. And the reason that, uh, and some of the things that happen are things like, you don't stay in finite dimensional space. You don't stay in space, three plus one dimensional space. You're, you're sort of going out of the domain that the mathematics of general relativity has been set up to describe. And that's kind of why general relativity just has to say, whoops, you know, we can't describe that, sorry. Um, but we get to actually dig in and, and make a description. And I think some pretty interesting things will come out of that. I mean, one of the ones that I was just sort of starting to think about is, um, uh, it's kind of the faster than light question. I mean, anybody, a lot of people, when you tell them, well, you know, we've got this fundamental theory of physics, one of the first questions that they ask is, okay, does it mean that, you know, is warp drive possible type thing? So uh, I, I think it'd be interesting to answer that. It may be very difficult. It may be fraught with computational irreducibility and undecidability, but one can at least start off looking at that. And so one of the notions is these things called, I'm calling space tunnels, which are kind of these parts of the universe where there's a, where there's a region of higher dimensional space that has different connectivity between different parts. I don't know whether that can work. I don't know whether it will really occur in our models. I was actually about to do a hunt for space tunnels in our models. We'll see what happens. But there are a lot of, lot of weird things that, um, that one can understand. I, I mean, one of the things we're going towards is having an operationalized understanding of things like Hawking radiation and the black hole information paradox in the context of our models and being able to actually see explicitly what happens to that quantum information when the black hole event horizon forms and how does it exist? We think it exists in the zone between the entanglement horizon in, in branchial space and the causal horizon in physical space. We think that the quantum information is preserved there, but we should be able to actually simulate that. We should be able to actually see that with, with little you know, uh, edges of, of multi-way graphs in our model and so on. So those are some things that are happening there. Well, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think, let's see, I had all kinds of questions, but I think maybe what I should do first is just to show you a little bit about, um, let's do this here. Uh, so this is our website, which hopefully people have seen. I just want to give you a little bit of a tour of what's there and what's, what's, what we've been adding to this. So, so just a, a reminder, this is kind of our visual summary of, of our model. Um, this is kind of the, the underlying rule, the different kinds of rule updates, the, oops, I'm not showing my screen, it says, okay, so let me, uh, share, does that work? Hope so. Okay, let me go back to what I was saying. So, so I just want to give you a little bit of a tour of, um, uh, of our physics project website and some of the things that are on it and um, things we're doing. So first, kind of the visual summary, good place to start. Uh, not, you know, once you understand things, is a good place to summarize what's going on. Um, underlying rule, different possible updates of a network. Well, a, a network going through a sequence of updates. This is the kind of spatial hypergraph that emerges where the extent of this hypergraph represents the extent of space. Um, the, uh, from that, you can uh, look at the different events that occur that update that hypergraph and look at their causal relationships, and that's over here. And that is the thing that represents where we can start looking at uh, the way that relativity works, um, special relativity and general relativity, and the way that slices through this causal graph can be interpreted as uh, views of the spatial hypergraph in particular reference frames. So then the bigger story is the multi-way graph, which we're showing, well, there's the multi-way graph here, which shows all the different possible updates, all the different sequences of possible updates with their branching and, and merging and so on. This is the sort of the combination of the multi-way graph and the causal relationships between these, uh, these uh, updating events that we're seeing here. This is kind of the, the, the full graph of everything. And then, I mentioned before the branchial graph, that's the slice. This is time going down as it always does here. This is a slice in time 
And instead of being a slice through space, it's a space, a slice through branchial space. It represents here the entanglement of quantum states. And that's this branchial graph here. So anyway, this is the uh, visual project summary. You can, you can make this nice and big. It, 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 um, it, uh, it zooms in to, to high uh, whatever. And I think there's a, there's a sort of swag plan that involves posters of this and, and other such things. Um, okay. Uh, I did write a two week update on the project. Um, I think we're going to transition to writing more of these bulletins rather than um, uh, aggregated updates, but that has a bunch of things, particularly about distributed computing in it. Um, I do recommend because I, I, people ask, keep, people keep on asking me about the backstory of this project. I did write out a pretty um, uh, 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 detailed backstory about the project. One of the things we're hoping to do is to have a scrapbook for the project. I have a bunch of material for that going back um, 30 years or more um, about sort of how the project got to where it is now. Okay, we've got my technical introduction to the project, um, which is uh, um, about 450 pages, I think, of material. Um, the, uh, uh, and um, this is, uh, you can now find this also on the archive preprint server. Um, and uh, why is this, oh my gosh, it's not scrolling on this page, odd. Um, the, uh, it's interesting. Um, that's a bug. Okay, so there is a link there to the ARCHIP preprint server where you'll find a version of this as a single PDF. You can download it from here as a PDF if you want to. There's also a link that I'm not able to show here because it's off the bottom of the screen, but there's a link to this new kind of peer review mechanism that we've tried to build. Um, the idea of which people are like, well, you know, let, let's see whether we can leverage things in, uh, from the academic world that in some cases have developed in rather rather weird ways, but let's see what we can leverage from the academic world to uh, uh, to give the the greatest strength to our um, to our project, and so kind of get people to comment on and peer review and so on things one is doing is one of those approaches, and so we're providing a kind of an open peer review platform, um, which so far has not seen as much use as I might hope. Um, but uh, uh, to, to give detailed comments on, on this paper and another material that we have. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the, um, I, I should have said that the, the kind of the, uh, people probably know this, but, but we have a, uh, I, I wrote sort of a, a, um, a basic introduction to this project um, as, uh, as a post. And this, is, this um, technical introduction is a more detailed um, description of what's going on. Um, the, oh, there we go. Now, for some reason, I managed to get to this peer review link. Okay, great. The, um, okay, so uh, um, also here is um, we have our technical documents and related material. So it's both my technical introduction and uh, two papers from Jonathan that are uh, more uh, mathematically sophisticated, I would say, than mine and more kind of, I would say, uh, uh, more oriented towards uh, sort of uh, formal uh, derivations and, and definitions and so on. One about some relativistic and gravitational features of the model and one about quantum mechanical features of the model. So, um, and uh, we are about to add some additional sections to this page for uh, things that come next. We've already got a few, we, we want to add both for technical papers that um, are building on the model and for commentary and uh, sort of uh, uh, expositions of the model that we think um, uh, sort of add depth and of understanding of what's going on. And there are, there are several of these that have come out um, and uh, it's some nice work by, by lots of people um, and those will start showing up on this page soon. Um, we have, um, uh, there will be another section here um, that's about external references. One of the things that's happened is um, that people have been sending us, oh, did you know about this paper that was published in 1974 that says this about causal sets or whatever? Um, we think it's useful to collect all those together. They've been a very disparate literature that usually don't refer to each other. It's a little disappointing how few of them managed to refer to the NKS book, but that's, um, that's so it goes. Um, but there's a, a sort of a very fragmented literature of things that are now uh, sort of all collect together 
and are sort of knitted together by our project. And so we want to kind of collect and organize bibliography of those things. Um, the, uh, okay, so um, another thing that is here, well, let me show you, okay. Um, uh, project Q and A, we've been progressively adding to this. Uh, we think we're doing a decent job here. And as people send us questions and we've been getting, I would say a lot of mail. Um, the, uh, um, so we've been trying to answer it. So be patient if, if um, we don't get to it immediately, but um, uh, that has revealed a bunch of sort of um, uh, common uh, questions um, that, uh, you know, how do your models relate to tensor networks, things like this, that we've tried to collect um, on this page um, and centrally answer. And so I do encourage people to look at these pages because I think they, they, do, they do answer a bunch of questions. They really are FAQs, so to speak. Um, okay, next uh, big area here is our software tools. Um, there's both an introduction that I wrote actually to, to these tools that is um, um, uh, that kind of is a, is a way to kind of get people started. And I encourage people to look at this because anything you see here, you can actually run directly in the Wolfram Cloud. Uh, you can get, um, if, you, if you want to actually do your own fresh computations, get a Cloud Basic account, um, just sign up for free um, and start doing computation. If you want to compute the universe for a long time, you're going to be burning somebody's CPU and hopefully that won't be ours. And so you should download all this stuff and get an actual downloaded copy of Wolfram 1 or something to run Wolfram language locally. But um, that's, um, uh, that's sort of an introduction to the tools. Now, we also have um, uh, a lot of um, uh, actual functions that we've created uh, for doing computations um, uh, with, with our models. And these are, these are good uh, kind of, um, you know, these are the functions that we use. And within my technical paper, for example, every single picture that is in there has the code that generates it, typically using these functions. So for example, if we look at multi-way system, here it is, it's got pretty extensive documentation and um, it goes on and on and on and on and on showing how to use multi-way system. So this is, this is really a, a major um, sort of jumpstart to people who are studying these models um, in, a, in a serious way. So uh, also here is, um, uh, Max's um, uh, GitHub project uh, for um, um, the um, uh, that's an implementation of these of these models. Um, it's the it's the source code of all of that implementation, including low level C plus plus code as well as lots of Wolfram language code. And we've started to see some contributions happening on GitHub to this, and that's terrific. I think the big frontiers there are parallelizing the code. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing that is that making use of that code is visualization in virtual reality and doing things like 3D printing. These are things that we're, we're working on and, and I think uh, some, some, some outside contributors have also been starting to, to work on. So that's, some, uh, that's a really nice thing to see. So uh, we also have our registry of notable universes, which um, since launch has been um, developing a bit uh, let's pick a universe here, um, uh, short code 1429. Okay, let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at more of this. Um, so, so here we have um, a bunch of kind of standard computations done on that particular universe. And these are, these are active things that we can redo here and do computations on. Okay, so there's the causal graph for that universe. There's the, actually, this is an interesting one. Huh, see, I, I keep on, as I, as I research these, um, these universes or these models, I keep on wanting, oh, I need an example of something that does blah. And so the idea of this uh, registry of notable universes is, is provide that uh, source for, you know, for interesting uh, cases that can be explored. And we, we actually have a, um, there's a function, Wolfram model data um, now within that is part of the functions from the Wolfram Physics project um, that allows one to programmatically access. It's kind of a functional level API um, for, um, uh, for this um, registry. And that allows one to go and sort of say, as I just did, 
you know, what kind of causal structure, what kind of global causal structure in the sense of black holes and event horizons and so on, do all of these different models that we picked out as interesting, what do they show? So that was something I was able to do in like a couple of lines and that's a useful thing. And it's, it's sort of a meta thing because these actual, you know, there's sort of a, a, an issue of, of how do you, um, you know, what are the interesting rules to look at with respect to that? So anyway, the registry um, has been useful for that. And I think we're gonna see further development of the registry. Um, along with the registry, we also have a uh, visual gallery, which is being progressively developed. So you'll find nice high-res versions of um, a bunch of images in here. Uh, what is coming really soon is uh, 3D geometry for all of these. Um, that's been a little bit tricky because a lot of times the 3D geometry, I mean, if I pull over, let me pull one in. Let me pull an interesting 3D geometry in here. Let's pick one out. Uh, hold on a second. Um, bah, 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 bah. Oh, I'll show you something I just did last night. Um, uh, let's see, I have to change this notebook down. Let's see if this works. Okay, there we go. Okay, this is, so this is a typical 3D geometry. This is a geometry in ruleal space, which is a separate thing to talk about. Um, but uh, the issue of this geometry is if you move it into a typical 3D printing setup, you've got a lot of spheres, you've got a lot of tubes, there are an awful lot of polygons representing that, and it's kind of unwieldy. We kind of need a different format for representing that. In addition, most of these things are, for example, too spindly to 3D print, so that's been a, been a nuisance. Um, but that's something we hope will get solved. And we know there are a bunch of people um, who are interested in contributing to that. And we encourage that um, as a way to start getting uh, really good virtual reality experiences. We, we've been developing in, in Unity a, um, a system for allowing one to pick up pieces of graphs and use the sort of spring electrical embedding and have the graphs kind of move around in real time as you're pulling them. But unfortunately, the act of pulling requires controllers that are like, you know, finger motion sensing controllers and things that we need people to contribute. Okay, so let me just show you a few more things on the, on the website here. Um, there's our working material archives. So this goes all the way back to 1994. Isn't it cool that we can still run more from language notebooks from 1994? I'm proud of that. Um, but more importantly for today, um, we are, uh, populating right after we do a live stream, we are populating this with them. Um, so for example, that one about rural space, I wonder whether that's populated here. That may not yet be in here because I didn't do an upload. Um, oh, maybe it is, it's here, but it doesn't have an icon yet. Um, okay, so what's, what's happening here is as we, I mean, this is very much an open science project. Um, as, we, um, uh, as we do things, we are uploading them to the cloud, to our cloud, um, and they will show up here in our archives. Um, so this is something where all of the stuff that we're doing in all of our live streams, all of the kind of offline stuff that we're doing, all available here as notebooks that you can do computations with. Um, so uh, that's some, um, so you can kind of, kind of get a sense of what's happening there. Now we also have um, actual archives of the live streams we've been doing um, we are slowly going to get the 430 hours of uh, pre-launch uh, discussions that we did. Those will, those will eventually show up. Um, and, uh, but, but you can find um, live streams uh, that we've been doing since launch um, here. And um, uh, what you will soon see, he says, let me see if I can find it here. Humph, humphity humph, humphity humph. Um, uh, maybe it's here. Okay. What you should soon start to see is some um, summaries of live streams. So we have summaries that are word clouds together with using our new video capabilities in Wolfram Language. It's very, very easy for us to do. It's called Video Frames List. Um, and it just allows us to get summaries. I haven't yet had a chance to play with these, but it looks kind of cool here to get a sort of summary of what happened in the live stream by seeing this kind of. Um, Visual thing, and this will be a super boring. This live stream so far will be mostly pretty boring because there'll be one of these. It's just somebody yakking live streams. I'll have to check whether my book arrangement is um, how much that's changing. But anyway, so um, so this is something that's coming as these visual summaries, and we also have been running live streams 
um, through uh, speech to text, orphan language, speech recognize, um, so that we're getting word clouds of what happened in the live stream also. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that's, that's coming quite soon. Um, I mentioned the scrapbook, which isn't here yet. Uh, let me mention the how you can help. Uh, actually, let me, let me go to the um, uh, discussion forum. This is on our Wolfram community. Um, and um, uh, recommend that as a place to chat with people about, um, about things in this project. Um, let, me, um, let me mention um, the general how you can help, uh, which as far as I'm concerned is, is important. Um, the, this is just sort of a very high level uh, outline of some of the different directions that we think are gonna be really fertile in looking at things in terms of physics, mathematics, computer science, kind of um, uh, using NKS ideas to sort of explore parts of the computational universe that inform what we're seeing in this model of physics, uh, things about computing and things about uh, the community um, and so on. And um, so uh, encourage help in these directions. And we expect that at our summer school, um, we'll be pursuing, people will be pursuing all of these different directions and we encourage people to, uh, to sign up for the summer school, which this year is virtual. We will have a bunch of, I think, really cool technology for people to interact with, including some things that um, you won't have seen yet because uh, they're, they're kind of new things that come out of the virtual world world um, that, uh, and uh, particularly a company that um, uh, I've been involved with for, for a while that I think is going to be delivering very soon a kind of a, a new form of, of sort of uh, gathering style interaction um, that I think will uh, actually, I really pushed them to do this because we really wanted it for our summer school, um, but it's gonna be great technology for, for people in general. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be using that at our summer school um, to, to provide a really good virtual experience, I think. Um, which, which brings me, I just want to keep on emphasizing our summer school because I think it's really, it's really gonna be a great place for, for us to interact with people and people interact to us and to learn where we've got to so far. Um, and uh, also for me, it's a great opportunity for me to learn things from people who come to our summer school and have particular kinds of expertise. So another thing I should mention, the, um, the book version of, uh, you know what, that is not the latest cover bug guys. Um, the, uh, the book version of um, a bunch of the kind of launch documents from this project are, um, uh, is off at the printers. Yes, it is. Printing books is a thing. There'll also be an ebook version of it. Um, the content is all available on the website, um, but this is kind of a nice packaging of it. Um, and uh, I, I thought, again, just like when I started writing the NKS book in 1991, I thought it was just going to be a very modest short book. Same, I thought here, um, NKS is 1,280 pages. This thing is about 800, it says 816 pages here. Um, but anyway, that should be available um, mid to late June. Um, and uh, uh, I encourage people, I think it'll be a nice, um, uh, a nice way to read uh, some of the material. Um, mention one, one final thing on this page, uh, which is our Twitter. Um, so we now have Wolf and Physics Twitter um, that we are posting. After every live stream, we're trying to post some kind of summary of what happened in the live stream, as well as other sorts of things that are going on. I should have mentioned one other thing that's coming to live streams, very bizarre concept. So, you know, I do lots of work on this project um, at random times of day and night and uh, I'm doing things, sometimes I'm talking to other people, but often I'm just working on my own. And um, when in the pre-launch period we were recording, I was recording a bunch of those things and I've continued to do that. And it's like, I guess we might as well make, this is an open science project, let's make all that stuff available. So we're going to have things called video work logs, um, which will be uh, arguably a bit of a paint drying kind of thing um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know whether they'll be interesting or not, but it's basically like my efforts to work on this bulletin about black holes. Uh, you know, it's many hours of actual work. Um, and, but we're going to make all of that stuff available as a video work log um, in, our, in our archive section. Uh, all right, so that's, um, that's a little bit of that. Um, 
So, so let me, let me, I, I, there are more things I can say, but let me, I have not been um, paying attention to questions that have been coming in. So let me, let me go back here and, um, uh, and address some of the questions that, that people have had and comments people have had here. Um, so first thing here is, is um, uh, people saying, want a dictionary or glossary of what's going on. Yes, yes, yes. I keep on day by day. I'm, I'm going to show you just to prove that this is not a purely uh, fictional thing. I am going to show you um, that we are working on a glossary. Where is the glossary? O2, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. There's the beginning of a glossary. Okay. And um, uh, uh, we're going to include in the glossary both, both terms that are special to our project and terms that are more uh, just things that come up a lot in our project, but which are known elsewhere. So hopefully that will be helpful. And um, I, maybe we should include, um, uh, particularly for the worst offenders, Jonathan and myself, uh, a pronunciation guide for some of these things, because um, we both have British accents, or I at least have a, a, a roughly British accent. And so some of these words lose some of their, their fine, um, for example, American uh, phonemes. Um, in, our, in our rendering of them. So we, we might want a pronunciation guide as well. But that is coming, hopefully uh, we have, it's all ready to be deployed on the website as soon as, as, soon as we actually have it written. Um, so let's see. It's a question here from Mean Machine Rex. So are we trying to invert a Rule 30-like algorithm? Not really. I mean, Rule 30 is a very specific uh, cellular automaton system, and we're not really trying to do. In fact, one of the one of the principles of this project is don't reverse engineer the universe. What do I mean by that? I mean one of the things one could say is, oh, we've noticed that uh, you know particles have this characteristic, and we've got this feature and that feature. Let's try and figure out by reverse engineering what that must mean about what's underneath in the universe. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're starting from the most minimal, most structureless kind of symbolic representation of the universe in terms of elements and relations. And then we're saying, what does that imply? And the amazing thing is that it generically implies a lot of things we're seeing in physics. Now, have we got all the way there? And are we using thinking that comes from what we know is true in physics? Absolutely, we haven't got all the way there. And we are absolutely using thinking that comes from what we know in physics. So for example, there are clues. Like, for example, the existence of fermions and bosons, um, and the fact that fermions are, are half integer spin particles, bosons are integer spin particles, the very quantization of spin in, uh, uh, that we know in physics, that's a clue. We don't yet quite know what, the, what that clue is a clue to, although I have a definite idea, um, which we'll see whether it plays out. Um, but uh, uh, this notion, so, so we're, we're using a few hints like that as a way, but not, we're not using those. We're not saying, given a hint, this should change our fundamental model. We're saying, given a hint, this is where we should look in our model. This is what we should explore in our model. So I, I, actually, actually, I hadn't really uh, enunciated that as clearly before. But, but so the difference between sort of the traditional reductionist science, given what you have, let's drill down and see what's underneath, and what we're doing is that in that approach, you're saying, let's reverse engineer from what we have now to figure out what must be underneath. What we're saying is, we've got a what's underneath, and we're sticking to it. But what that thing that's underneath that we've got implies many, 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 many things. And there's a question of which parts of what it implies should we explore. And for that, we're using what we know in physics. You know, where to look, is being informed by what we know in physics. What it will ultimately do, we don't have any wiggle room there. It's not like we can say, oh, whoops, our model implied 10 dimensional space, so we have to curl up the extra dimensions and the balls and things. We don't have that freedom. We're, we're just saying, we're, we're, uh, we haven't run into things where we need to have hacks like that. But we're also, we've got, um, uh, you know, we've got this underlying system and we're saying, what are its consequences? And now, you know, you look at something, I don't know, the Higgs mechanism for mass, for example. You know, I had some ideas recently about how that might work in our model. And it's like, okay, given that we know that that's a thing, how might it work in our model? Not, let's add a little blob to our model to give it the Higgs mechanism, so to speak. 
So um, let's see, there's a question from Adler here about when asked if we're in a simulation, you answer it'd be rather boring for someone to do that since all you need is a simple rule. And yet here you're trying to do just that. Let's see. You know, one of the things that's been really fun is, you know, I think there are a lot of philosophical implications of what we're trying to do with this model. And I would say that some of the, some of the very interesting correspondence that we've had uh, tries to explore some of those philosophical implications and relate them to some ideas, Spinoza, Plato, whatever else, some things that have been sort of thought about philosophically in the past. How does that relate? Now that we have a concrete idea for what, you know, how the universe might actually be built, it kind of focuses the mind in terms of thinking about these philosophical questions. We had some very interesting uh, points that people have made, which always take me a little while to unpack. So this one is is um, is taking me a little while to unpack as well because um, uh, they're saying that um, uh, you know there is no choice in a sense. You know the operation of the universe according to some simple rule described by some simple rule. The universe just does what it does. And you might say that the operator of that, if there was an operator of the universe, whatever that means, because the operator has nothing to do, the operator is just saying, there is this rule. Here it is, boom, 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 and off it goes. Now, the comment being made here is that, um, uh, in a sense, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do, is to be that operator, is to see what the consequences of that rule actually are. Um, so, uh, yes, that's, that's a... Um, uh, that's kind of, a, um, uh, in a sense, uh, an irony of this. Now, I might, might say that um, um, in, um, uh, you know, there are so many interesting things. I mean, so I think we have a, a pretty good understanding of why there's only one universe and of the idea that different uh, foliations in, uh, of ruleal space, of the space of, of rules, um, are what give you the different perceptions of how our universe works. And it's a, really a strange thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, actually. And it's fascinating that sort of our way of integrating what happens in the universe, of so this notion of things we call objects in the universe, notions of space and time and so on, there could be a, a sort of the aliens, so to speak, could have a vastly, vastly different interpretation of what's going on in the universe, even though it's ultimately the same universe. And we're sort of exploring this idea of the space of all possible rules and this evolution in where every possible rule can be applied and this notion of ruleal space where you're taking something just like branchial space is slicing across the space of quantum states. Ruleal space is slicing across the possible uh, rules that can be applied in the universe. And it looks very much as if the, uh, uh, the kind of the mathematics of ruleal space uh, kind of provides a geometrization of computation, which is really interesting. I mean, just as, so, you know, speed of light. What is the speed of light? The speed of light in our models is the conversion between the distance in the hypergraph and it's kind of the, the constant of proportionality for edges in the causal graph. So it's saying, how much does an edge in the causal graph go in space relative to how much it goes in time? It's the space divided by time for that. Well, now, there's a, a, a maximum entanglement speed, uh, which we're calling zeta, which, is, which occurs in, um, uh, in the multi-way graph, and it characterizes the maximum rate at which quantum states can get entangled. And so it's another kind of constant of nature. In a rough estimate that I had, it might be 10 to the five solar masses per second, pretty big um, by our standards. Well, then in the, in the ruleal graph, there's yet another uh, sort of a universal constant of nature, which is the, the rate of exploring different uh, rules, um, the maximum rate of, of, of essentially translating from one rule system to another, we're calling that rho. And I think there's going to be kind of a, a, a geometrization of computational complexity theory that will be possible by thinking about that space. And so, for example, one unsolved problem is uh, what looks like, looks to be the case, and it's really beautiful, is that the Einstein's equa Einstein equations in physical space are the analog, the analog of those in branchial space is the Feynman path integral. And the question is, what is the analog of that in ruleal space? What is the analog of the Einstein equations in ruleal space? What's the analog of, uh, 
what's the analog of, of for example, of curvature in, um, uh, in Rulial space? We have some ideas about that. What's the analog, what's the generator insofar as there's lots of computation going on somewhere in Rulial space, just like there's lots of energy momentum somewhere in physical space, there's lots of energy momentum somewhere in, in branchial space. Um, what does that do? How does that turn the GD6 in Rulial space? And what does that mean for uh, for sort of the fundamental ideas of computation. But um, uh, anyway, that, that's, um, that's sort of a, a coming attraction here. Um, okay, so question here, are there courses on how to mine the computational universe in NKS style or how to do NKS engineering? So the answer is our summer school is, is most of what there is. I, I'm really hoping, you know, it's a very complicated thing to, to sort of inject you know, one of the things I'm sort of disappointed didn't more of it has not happened is the basic science of the computational universe. I mean, that's what I should have launched when I really sort of pushed the idea of complexity theory back in the 1980s is this, it really turned into apply computational type models to lots of different kinds of things as opposed to study those models for their own sake. And there's so much more to do there. And I, I'm hoping that the interest in physics uh, will lead to more basic study of the computational universe, more study of, okay, you know, you don't want to sign up for the full hypergraph experience, so to speak. Let's study string manipulation systems or some such other thing um, as a way to get intuition that can then potentially be used for the full physics case. Um, but there's a lot to do there. And by the way, this, the, you know, one of the things is that, that any sufficiently simple model finds many applications. And with cellular automata, they have found many, many, many applications because they are very simple models. They're very minimal models of things with states laid out in space that evolve in time. So similarly, with these models that we've developed with elements and relations and so on that turn into hypergraphs, they're also very, very minimal models. And they too can find many applications that are not even that have nothing to do with physics, for example. So I already mentioned distributed computing. I have a suspicion that there's going to be a very abstract model of biological evolution that's going to be made possible by looking at these systems. I also suspect there might be a more global theory of machine learning that's made possible by looking at these systems. And this is using, in a sense, the idea of these models and using some of the intuition that's arisen from uh, uh, thinking about these models in terms of physics um, but not using any of the full details of, you know, and that's how uh, the Einstein equations work and so on. Although there might be an analog of that. There might be, an, you know, the Einstein equations turn out to be a more generic kind of thing. They're not this very specific thing. They're a more generic kind of idea, more powerful idea perhaps than one had already known. So, um, so the answer is, I, I wish there was more, you know, this, this question of sort of, uh, making there be more sort of basic science of the computational universe studied out there in the world. It's a very, very fertile area. It's an area really very suitable for academic study. Um, and uh, we just need to get more uh, kind of, uh, it's probably, probably the things I have to do. I should probably write a textbook about these things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Although the NKS book, I think is a, is a good start for that. Um, but there's kind of a, uh, 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 kind of a more step-by-step -step sort of um, uh, learning-based uh, version of it, perhaps. Okay, there's a question here. What is the prereq to NKS, the prerequisites to NKS? I think pretty much nothing. I mean, what's been really cool over the last 18 years since the NKS book has come out, an awful lot of people have told me, uh, it makes me feel very old, They've said, oh, I, I read that book when I was you know, 10, 11 years old or something, and it really changed my outlook on a lot of things, and now I'm doing some kind of science or technology or whatever else. And I, 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 I like to think that the book really doesn't have, I mean, I wrote it, my, one of the things that caused it to take 10 years to write was that I was trying to write it with sort of ultimate clarity, so to speak. So there were no, uh, there was no sort of additional fluff of ideas that wasn't really necessary. And so it really started from, from nothing to be able to build up to what it's talking about. Now, some of that build up, I mean, one thing I learned is that doing that for the section on fundamental physics was probably a mistake because the people who are in fundamental physics 
kind of, they look at it and they say, it's built from nothing. It's like, how can it be built from nothing? I mean, we have all this stuff in, you know, tensor calculus and we have all these, these uh, uh, approaches that are, you know, represented in terms of formulas and so on. Well, it turns out I had managed to distill those things down to the point where I didn't need all of that superstructure, but it made it more difficult for somebody who knows that superstructure to read it, I think. Um, at least that's the only excuse I can come up with. Um, Uh, let's see. Um, uh, a comment from Martin about Ray Kurzweil uh, when NKS came out 18 years ago talking about its inability of recreating consciousness. You know, one of the things I found amusing about that, one of the things that Ray said was, oh, you'll, um, you'll never be able to do something like compose music. Well, just a few years later, I wasn't even remembering that Ray had said this at the time when we did this, but, but um, a few years later, we made this thing called Wolfram Tones which is a, a website that just goes out into the computational universe and plucks cellular automata that make nice tunes. So in a sense, just, just like in, you know, one can do photography of the natural world and get very beautiful pictures. So we're doing sort of, uh, um, uh, what's the analog, audiography or something of the computational world um, and um, uh, to get nice tunes from just exploring, just plucking things out of mining the computational universe. So, so the idea that there, there isn't creativity in the computational universe, I don't think that's really a, a supportable idea. And, and this notion of how kind of um, how brains work and how what the uniqueness of intelligence is and so on, I think over the last 18 years, I've, I've had a much clearer understanding of that. And it's, um, I mean, basically the way I see it these days is there's this kind of ocean of computational possibility that exists in the computational universe. Uh, you know, programs that do incredibly complicated things, all kinds of elaborate stuff. Programs that replicate, I don't know, what the weather is doing, what this is doing, what that's doing. And programs that are very simple in their construction, but that when you look at pictures of what they do, it's just like, wow, that's really complicated. Okay, so now the question is, and then that's one thing. There's the computational universe, this ocean of computational possibility. On the other hand, there's the kind of what, uh, what we humans care about doing, the particular things that we have words for, the particular operations that we do, the particular things that our civilization values and so on. Well, that's a very small subset of what's possible in the computational universe. And so the key thing that's necessary to sort of realize AI and things like that is to somehow uh, sort of have a, a, a translation between the things we want to do and the things we think about and the things we have a framework for thinking about and the things that are possible in the computational universe. And that's in a sense, my life work of building Wolfram language, building this kind of full scale computational language that forms a bridge between the things that we, we think about and the ways we have to think about things and what's possible in the computational universe. That's, um, uh, that's what I see as being the role of our uh, Wolfram language, this sort of full-scale computational language for describing the things we care about that are implementable in the computational world. Now, and so in a sense, my view at this point of kind of the, the world of sort of consciousness and things like that is, it's really very easy to get the raw material of consciousness. The issue is, can we connect it to what we care about in what we might talk of as consciousness that relates to our kind of historically and civilizationally and, cu and culturally defined notion of consciousness. And that really has to do with this language that allows us to, to encapsulate the things that we are thinking about and convert them, sort of uh, translate them to the computational universe. And, and that's in a sense, kind of my life work is involved in doing that. And uh, another big project that I hope to do is to make this kind of full symbolic discourse language which not only describes the kinds of um, uh, ideas about the world, but describes ideas about mental states and things like this um, that uh, we have not really put into symbolic form before. So that's some, um, uh, but, but I think that the, um, uh, this notion of this sort of understanding that there's this ocean of computation, there's us and our thinking, and there's this translation layer. And that translation layer, having that translation layer allows us to really think in terms of what's possible in the computational universe, to think in computational terms, kind of like the invention of mathematical notation 400 years ago gave people a medium to think about things mathematically. 
I like to think that the computational language we've built gives people a medium to think about things computationally, which will, I think, launch a lot of kind of computational X fields and so on. But, but that's, the, uh, that's the kind of, the, the significance of it is the, the, um, uh, that's the thing that takes this ocean of what's computationally possible, which by the way, is full of computational irreducibility and picks out those pieces that we can kind of wrap our brains around. And you know, we're seeing a lot of things in the kind of world of, of sort of how AI relates to the world. I mean, I think uh, you know, things I've worked on, um, uh, like last summer I, I was, did this testimony for the US Senate about, about uh, automated content selection businesses on the internet where, uh, where one's kind of AI is selecting what us humans are going to see. And I think that, that is, um, that's kind of a great example of where there's both computational irreducibility. It's like, you can't write a law that says, let's just look at the rules that are used by the AI and check that they're okay. Because computational irreducibility just bites you. Um, and uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, it, it, um, it doesn't let you do that. It doesn't let you say, what will the consequences be? Given, you know, show me the rules. Okay, now I know what the consequences will be. Any more than, frankly, in the operation of human laws that it's possible to readily foresee all the consequences of something. It's sort of the same thing, although it's more in your face in the case of the sort of computation, explicitly computational ideas in, in, in these kind of content selection systems. But, um, but then the kind of the realization that what really we need to be able to do is to have a computational description of our human preferences. So we kind of need this sort of AI contract, this computational contract that describes what we really want to see and then apply that um, to, to this actual uh, kind of, and sort of pick out, sculpt the part of this ocean of computation that we actually want. And that's kind of the challenge there. And um, so in any case, a sort of better understanding of those kinds of things. Um, it's a question here from Neo. Have you demonstrated results that agree with existing physics numerically from the computational machines? Absolutely. That's what, by the time you have the Einstein equations, you have general relativity. You know, can we, uh, once you have the path integral, you have quantum field theory. So all of the kind of, all of the consequences of those things kind of flow back. That's wh how we're leveraging 20th century physics. Now, if you say, can we predict a a new constant, like the mass of the electron, the electron muon mass ratio, we cannot yet do that. But there are some good indications that we may be able to do things like that. And there are predictions that you can make that don't require knowing those numbers. Like for example, one thing that I think is likely is um, the, uh, uh, there's things that we're calling oligons, which are these particles much lighter than electrons that can potentially be, be what form dark matter in the universe. There are other, kinds of things about, um, uh, for example, quantum correlations that exist, that should exist for photons orbiting black holes that might be visible, might be, uh, might be able to be seen. We, we, that's a case where it looks like sort of all the factors cancel out and it's just a, a prediction. You know, Einstein was really lucky in general relativity. Well, he was lucky in two ways. You know, he had this theory uh, the final theory is in 1915, but he had an earlier theory in 1911, I think. But then, then even the 1915 theory, the um, uh, well, I guess the, no, the, the, one of the predictions was that the bending of light around the sun would be a factor of two larger than it was predicted to be in Newtonian gravity. So it's nice that it was a, just a factor of two. You didn't have to know any new constants of nature. It was just a numerical factor. And, and that's the thing that we have to hope for in our theory, that there are cases where there are things which are just a numerical factor different, where you don't have to know some new constant of nature, which can be hard to determine because that requires doing experiments to determine that, and then you have to work out its consequences and so on. But so there, there may be one of those things for things like photons in orbit around a black hole. Um, and I mean, Einstein kind of lucked out because the, the original calculation, see there's one thing, once you have a theory, you then have to calculate its consequences. And you might have an absolutely wonderful and correct theory, but get wrong the consequences. So that happened to Newton, um, you know, in his original Principia, he computed the position of the moon and got it wrong basically by a factor of two in, in some measurement of, 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 of how you predict the position. And with Einstein also, he originally got the wrong answer 
uh, based his his actual calculation from his theory for the bending of light around the sun wasn't correct. And there was an attempt to go observe it, but I think the sky was cloudy and the eclipse that happened, or maybe it was the beginning of the First World War, and um, uh, uh, the um, uh, the equipment got impounded or something. I don't remember the full story. But in any case, that based on the then calculation, the conclusion would have been general relativity is wrong. By the time in 1919, by the time another experiment was done, which was a kind of flaky experiment actually, but but um, the theory, the the implications of the theory have been got right, and that experiment claimed at least to validate those predictions. So it's a it's a complicated thing. You've got the underlying theory, you've got the the calculating things from that underlying theory, then you've got the experiments which are also hard and can be gotten wrong. So that's sort of one path for validation. Another path for validation that I'm liking a lot is this kind of the compilation path, so to speak. The being able to take the methods of calculation that have existed in, in existing theories and being able to, to sort of compile them down to a new theory. And, and also, you know, I think we will be able to start generating. I mean, there, there are definite things about, you know, particular particles and their properties, particular gauge groups and so on. Uh, you know, we're within sight of being able to do some of those things haven't done them yet. And which of those will be generic to all theories of this class? Which of those will be specific to particular underlying rules? We don't know yet. And um, which particular underlying rules? See, see, this is one of the philosophically complicated things. We kind of know that all underlying rules are equivalent in some sense. The problem is with our way of doing physics, with our senses, with our way of describing the world, there will be particular rules that are the right ones to use for that. Even though if we were sort of aliens who had some other completely incoherent way of describing the world, uh, a different rule might be the suitable one to use. But so what we're doing, it's kind of another one of these language design type things. We're trying to find a rule that we uh, understand who's, who's this, which describes the world in ways that we can relate to, and which by the way also, the sort of the third leg is the computational leg that can be represented computationally. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. And um, uh, you know, how complicated that rule is going to be, we just can't say, we just have no idea. Um, probably not incredibly complicated because otherwise it would be hard to explain some regularity in the universe, maybe, um, but we don't really know how complicated it is. And that's, you know, that's the big hunt that we are slowly getting started on, but we're still, we're still digging through the, the um, we're still kind of digging through the layers of computational reducibility that exist from existing physics. And frankly, that's going so well that uh, you know, we're still digging through that. And those are really high payoff because when you get one of those computationally reducible things, you're seeing things which, are, which give you predictions and all those kinds of things. When you get to the layer of irreducibility, you might have a situation where you say, well, gosh, you know, that's very nice. And, and that rule might describe the universe, but you have to run it 10 to the 100 times which is the number of times the universe has run it, and that's impossible for us to do. So that, that's some, uh, that's some, great. Let's see, uh, question here. Would a 59-year-old semi-retired chemist fit into the summer school? Uh, the, answer, the answer is yes. Uh, really, the summer school is for people who are interested in exploring new ideas, doing new things. And um, uh, I like to think that even at my ancient age, um, I'm still in that, in that world. And so yes, um, by implication that, that, um, um, uh, that should apply too. Uh, the, um, the physics track of the summer school, um, what we're doing is the main summer school is a three week program. And the big point of the summer school is for everybody to do an original project. And uh, I'm usually the one involved in, um, uh, in figuring out um, those projects. And uh, we've been, I accumulate all year, this list of cool things that are possible. And then some fraction of the ones that I thought might be possible get done. And some other chunk of ones that come from actually talking to people and seeing their interests uh, as the driving force get, get done. But um, this year, so there'll be a three week program that is our main summer school. Then there's a week zero at the beginning, which is a kind of a, a, a precursor uh, for people who want to really get serious about fundamental physics, where we're kind of explaining what we figured out so far, um, uh, the sort of depth of stuff that we figured out so far in the, in the fundamental physics project. 
Um, but uh, uh, we encourage, uh, you know, absolutely, um, send in your information. Um, okay, there's a Alessandro complaining, it's too hard to attend the, attend the summer school from Italy because of the timetable. This is one of these things where it's like our causal graphs. It's kind of like there's a space and time and so on. In most years, the last 17 years, people physically come to the US to come to the summer school. And um, that means that um, people shift to the local time zone and the summer school operates in the local time zone. This year, we're doing things virtually, but in order to have sort of a cohesive summer school, we really want people to be available at the, um, you know, not time shifted. So it's kind of like a, a, um, a, a travel in place concept, so to speak, that yes, the schedule does have to be somewhat shifted. We're trying to actually, quite a lot of our instructors are in Europe. So I think you'll find if you look in detail at the time, the times that um, the things we're planning are not that un unfriendly to the European crowd. Um, but uh, it should, it should work okay. I mean, we, you know, we, we just want to have the summer school be a synchronous experience rather than a, um, uh, what's the right analogy here? I mean, it's, it's, we, we don't want space-like separated pieces of the summer school. Um, we want the summer school to be a time-like experience, so to speak. Um, and so we don't want this, um, uh, um, is that the right analogy? Well, close to that. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Brian is saying, my biggest hindrance is fear of not knowing the correct terminology. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that. We're, we're, you know, one of the things that I like to believe, you know, we're cutting across so many different areas. Um, you know, uh, really nobody knows all of these areas, including, including me, for example. I mean, I'm, you know, it's um, uh, uh, the, the we're, we're just, you know, we're just kind of, um, uh, um, it's, it's kind of our responsibility to explain this in, in terms that people can understand, I think. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about not knowing about some particular technical area here or there. I mean, the fact is, to really be involved in the sort of connecting to 20th century physics, you need to know 20th century physics, and that's kind of complicated. Um, but there's plenty of other things connecting to mathematics, connecting to computer science, and so on, where there's much, well, in the particularly computer science area, there's much less depth of stuff to know. I mean, the physics area is particularly tall tower of existing knowledge. Um, I would say the mathematics area, well, actually I don't know some of those towers as well as I might. So I was mentioning that with respect to category theory. So I can't tell you just how tall those towers are. I mean, the, I understand them to a certain level and they don't seem that tall at the level that I understand them, but that I may not know, you know, all the way down, so to speak. Um, uh, Einstein von Rembrandt is saying, made progress on a project for the summer school. That's great. It's been fun learning how to use our powerful chemistry functionality. Great. Yeah, we're, we're pretty proud of that and, and there's more coming. Um, okay, Alexander is saying, I've heard some influential people in my work in open source say that distributed computing is really a physics problem at heart, not as much as a computer science problem. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's what, we're, that's what we're beginning to see. And that's, it's, it's interesting that a number of people have, have said that in our live streams particularly. Um, I mean, there really is a, a grand unification of this problem of distributed computing and these problems of physics. Physics, okay, physics is hard, but the good news about physics is a lot of smart people worked on it in the 20th century and, um, and the 21st, but particularly the, the foundations were laid in the 20th century. Um, and, and they built a, a tower that we can now use to look out at distributed computing and see a lot of interesting things. And, and what we're seeing in our physics project is really the connection between those two things. And I, I, think, I think it's gonna be a super fertile area. And I think that's really, I think also the, you know, what can happen in, in theoretical computer science, I mean, I could criticize every area, including my own work, but, but um, what can happen is that something that is quite simple when you just write it in computational terms, and this is also an importance of our sort of full-scale computational language idea, if you write it in computational terms, it's actually pretty easy to explain. If you try and write it in sort of pseudo-mathematical terms, it's incredibly hairy. Um, and we see that 
oh, for example, the theory of graph rewriting, which we would like to use, but it's just so, you know, it's like, yes, I can understand this, but it's written in mathematics that it's just a very poor fit in many ways because people thought that's the language, we, that's the only language we have available to describe these kinds of things. Um, and that's, you know, in, in our computational language, it's much simpler to explain what one's talking about. And I think we will see that in the distributed computing case, but we need a few ideas that I think are coming from the physics project, particularly about how to parameterize reference frames. That's, in my opinion, that's the big thing. It's like, you can think about that depth first search, breadth first search. Okay, parameterize the versions of breadth first search. That's an example of a, a version of this question. Parameterize the evaluation front for recursive evaluation. It's all kind of the same type of problem. Maybe it's related to third order category theory. I don't know. Um, the, uh, but that's, that's kind of what we have to, in my view, that's what we have to think about. And there will be, okay, so this relates to kind of language design thing. There will be primitives, language primitives that allow us to describe those uh, reference frames that, are, that relates to what we humans can understand. And that's what we have to figure out. Now, it may take taking our human understanding a little bit off in some di direction it has never been in before. But, you know, you, you know what, what I've learned in language design is that there are things that people are immediately familiar with. Okay, they immediately have an intuitive understanding. What is a list? Okay, they have a pretty easy intuitive understanding of that. What is a nest? You know, what does nest do? You know, F, F of F, F of F, of F, of F, of F, et cetera. That's a little bit more complicated. Then there are other things where, and the question is, you know, what does fold do? What does fold pairless do? What, what, what do these different things do? Well, you, you have to kind of, uh, there are some things which are concepts that are important enough that it's worth really pushing people to understand them, but you only get a certain number of shots. That is, if you tell people there are a thousand concepts you need to understand to see what's going on, it's, it's hopeless. I mean, uh, you know, and that's not, you know, it would apply to me as applies to anybody. Um, it's just, you're not gonna learn them. If you say there are three concepts you need to understand to understand all of this stuff, then you've got a chance. And sometimes those concepts are hard, just like in an area like calculus. You know, people, there are some concepts that are kind of hard. You know, what is a function really? What is a, you know, what's a limit? How does that work? There are some concepts there. And people, you know, that's a hill people climb in the educational system learning those things. I would say that in the computational area, these areas of sort of fundamental computation, there isn't really a great, uh, well, you know, we've, we've tried to build this with our computational language, a way to kind of provide an educational on-ramp to those ideas. But there's vastly more that can be done in that direction. I mean, I wrote a little book, Elementary Introduction to the World and Language, a few years ago. Uh, I'm kind of hoping for many more books along the same lines that really provide an on-ramp to these you know, limited number of computational ideas. Well, so what I think is gonna happen in distributed computing is with a lot of effort, we're gonna find a small number of really good ideas that allow us to parameterize these notions of how does, you know, what are these reference frames? How do evaluation fronts work? How does, you know, what, how do we parameterize breadth first search? What are the useful parameterizations of those things? I mean, I tried back uh, 40 years ago in my first language, SMP, I tried to make some of these parameterizations and they were a total flop because nobody understood them. I mean, admittedly, I only had two there, but they were incomprehensible. I think they're still incomprehensible. Although, you know, it's a funny thing because as the world moves on, what's comprehensible changes because people have a different ambient understanding of things. But anyway, I think that's a, it's a fantastic frontier. And I think it is the case that, you know, between distributed blockchains and, and uh, uh, ideas of distributed computing and so on, it's all coming together with, um, uh, with these questions in physics and a lot of important cross-fertilization there. Um, how many people are currently working on our physics project? Well, it's been basically three people doing science side of it, but it's starting to be a lot more and we don't know how many it is. I mean, we've been hearing, I think we've had, I'm now gonna say something that is completely wrong. I think they're like 50 something people who are in various stages of, of um, of uh, potentially coming to our, our uh, physics track of our summer school. And that represents some, I mean, the, 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 the smaller number who are sort of confirmed, but that's the number I think that are sort of on, on potential track to do that. Um, the, um, 
I think the, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, actually. I, I, I mean, it, it's some, um, um, you know, we're, I, I think we're a little bit too early to be able to start seeing the flow of academic papers and things from this. Um, I'm hoping that will develop over the coming weeks and months. Um, and I'm going to be excited to see that. Um, but I think we don't yet know how many, how many seeds are, are, are currently germinating and um, about to turn into wonderful flowers, so to speak. Um, so, oh, Alessandro says it would be nice to see animations of evolving hypergraphs. Absolutely. I have wanted that since the early 1990s. It's really hard to do. Help us do it. Okay, so here's the problem. The problem is you have a graph and that graph is, um, uh, you make a change to the graph, but somehow as you, uh, uh, once you have a graph, there's no abstract specification of how that graph should be laid out. So it's up to the graph layout algorithm, how it lays the graph out. Now you change the graph and the graph layout algorithm says, well, that's a different graph. I'm gonna lay it out differently. The question is how do you map the layout of one graph into the layout of another graph in a consistent way. So I think what it's gonna look like, is a little bit like when you see a bunch of soap bubbles and they are forming their sort of minimal surfaces between them and so on. And then one pops and you see the whole, you know, you, sometimes you see the soap bubbles gradually, the soap foam gradually kind of move around a bit and then a bubble pops and things rearrange themselves. I think that's what we'll see when we can do animations of these things. We really want to do these animations. We really, really want these. So we've had a number of people who've contacted us saying that they've got some uh, ideas about how to do that. Um, I am not, you know, th this is one of the things that happens about a project like this. You know, I, I this is some um, people say to me sometimes, what are people doing with Wolfram language? I don't know. There's millions of people doing things, you know, every day. And it's, it's some, um, and, and every so often I'll find out uh, sometimes I'll find out a decade later that some terrific piece of technology or science that got done, they say, oh yeah, I, I used Mathematica to do that. Okay, great. That's some, um, you know, but I, it, it was a decade later that I found that out. You know, it's, it's very hard to know sometimes what's happening. I mean, sometimes it's clearer when people are producing papers and, and posts and so on about what's happening, but um, otherwise it's kind of hard to know. But anyway, there've been several people who've been interested in, in this problem. Um, but it, it is a difficult problem. And I think the way that I would like to really see it, the thing I'd imagined back in the early 90s, when I first was thinking about sort of network-based models of space and time, was that one would live in a virtual reality. You know, virtual reality was a thing back in the early 90s, as it was a thing a few years ago as well. Um, the uh, one would sort of live in this virtual reality and uh, everything would be kind of activating around one. And in order to see what was going on, one would be able to like pull a piece of, I thought it was graphs, now hypergraphs, pull a piece of hypergraph and see the universe, kind of the representation of the universe uh, be, be affected by that pulling of that piece of hypergraph so that then the evolution, I had kind of had this, this vision of what it would look like with these kind of orange you know, flashes of events happening all over the place, being able to really see that uh, progressively in this, in this graph and being able to explore it like the jungle, so to speak, not that I've ever been in a real jungle, but anyway, what I imagine is a, a jungle of, um, uh, you know, you've got the foliage and you're pulling it away. And that might be the way that it would seem if you're in this hypergraph and you're pulling the foliage of, of different parts of the hypergraph away and you're able to see these kind of flashes of, of orange or something as different pieces of the hypergraph update. That's what I'd like to see. That's the environment I want. And if I can avoid myself being motion sick when I'm in that environment, all the better. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I want to see this. We want to see it. We don't have it. It's an algorithmic problem. Please help us solve it. Um, okay, let me see here. Um, oh, there's a question here from Alexander. Is the universe based on Wolfram models eventually consistent? Uh, referencing the CAP theorem, right. So, so eventual consistency is similar in databases, for example, is similar to our idea of causal invariance. So it may be exactly the same idea. It may be basically the same idea. Um, and causal invariance says, whichever updating order is microscopically used, in the end, it won't matter. And that seems to be what's at the heart of leading to relativistic invariance, leading to objectivity in quantum mechanics. So in a sense, objectivity in databases 
is the same as objectivity in quantum mechanics. That is, we do all these updates, you do these database updates, you know, they're all happening all over the place. And the question is, in the end, is it all consistent? And the answer would be, well, in the end, all these quantum observers think the universe did the same thing. Now, the difference between databases, maybe it isn't so much of a difference, but it, one might think of it as a difference between databases and the universe is, databases, there's an answer. You eventually, the database, you resolve it, you get to a state, you produce a result. The universe, hopefully, doesn't just stop, doesn't just terminate sometime. It just keeps running. Now, I think in, in the case of sort of distributed blockchain type solutions, you again have that situation. You've got this thing that keeps on running and you keep on observing it in these different reference frames. And eventual consistency is kind of the story of oh, you can't you know, double spend that token or something like this. There is eventual consistency. You know, these, these bank account balances eventually ma match, but that happens as a more dynamic thing in a sequence of reference frames. Um, so I think that's how it's, how it's going to work. Um, okay, there's a comment from Arnaud saying, Eric Verlind wrote a paper about gravity emerging from entropy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I talked to him about this a number of years ago. I did not really understand it, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, seems not far from space emerging from edges in hypergraph. I don't know. Actually, it's a good reminder. We should both look at that paper, potentially add it to our list of potentially relevant uh, papers. And also we should contact Eric Berlind and ask him if he'd like to join us on one of these live streams and tell us about his paper. Maybe I'll understand it better now that I've uh, if, if it indeed has things to say about, uh, about what, um, what we don't actually, you know, okay. So I have one data point because, because he didn't think that the stuff in NKS was relevant to what he'd done. So that being, if that's the case, that suggests that what he's done is probably not relevant to what we've done. Although maybe that relevance will be clearer if there is relevance based on the new kinds of things that we've done and this better understanding of kind of generic consequences of things. So don't know, but good suggestion there. Okay, Dan is asking, is there a concept of fitness metric for a given universe based on whether novel configurations emerge over time versus collapse into repeated structures? Interesting question. Um, the collapse into repeating structures is kind of a computational reducibility kind of thing. And I think, okay, I, okay, so termination, I think, I only understood this yesterday, termination in a part of the universe, that is, it just stops, is like a space-like singularity in general relativity. It's like the kind of singularity that's at the center of a Schwarzschild black hole, of a non-rotating black hole, a spherical symmetric black hole. Um, so uh, that is a kind of, you don't get any further from, from here type thing. I think, I mean, collapsing into repeated structures, truly repeating structures in the universe, in our model are probably like closed time-like curves. Now I say probably, it's a little bit of a complicated thing, but it's a question of what, in other words, if the universe precisely repeats itself, did time progress? In other words, our measurement of time is based on inexorable computation. That inexorable computation is related to thermodynamic time, is related to things like entropy increase, because entropy increase is about sort of the encryption of initial conditions through computation. So if the universe precisely repeats itself, did time advance? That's the question. And I think one can reasonably say time didn't advance. There's no marker of time advancing. There's no additional computation that got done because it's just, um, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of just repeating. So I think, that's what would happen there. So I think that uh, if things just repeat, they do not manage to show computational irreducibility and they will not be rich enough to be our universe. The one thing we know for certain about our universe is that it is capable of universal computation and it is sort of computationally sophisticated. That's what, that's what gives it a notion of time. Yeah, probably that's the best way to say it. Given that we know time exists, we know the universe is computationally sophisticated. If the universe wasn't computationally sophisticated, there would be no notion of time. We would have no perception of time because 
the things that would happen would not be, there would not be a progressive uh, thing that, that occurs in the universe. It would just be, oh, the universe got to the state and then it stopped, or the universe just kept on doing this thing. And there wouldn't be this notion, this, this psychological perception of time that we have. There wouldn't be this notion of progressive uh, things happening. And so I think the answer is that, that our universe has to have computational irreducibility in order to have a notion of time. And so that's, um, that, there, that is a criterion in terms of understanding what's a possible model. If the model doesn't have that computational irreducibility, it will have no notion of time. Okay, there's a question here. Why can't all science be open? You know, I mean, one thing that's been sort of interesting with this project is, you know, this project has, has a lot of different characteristics than many scientific projects. I mean, first of all, it's not really an incremental project. It's a big jump. Um, it's not really, you know, it, it wasn't done incrementally particularly. I mean, it was done, you know, we figured out certain things and then it was like, it will happen rather quickly. And it's not, you know, the result of a chain of a thousand papers. It's more, you know, it's, it's leveraging a lot of what was done in 20th century it's not physics, but, but it's still, this actual development is just like a weird prong. It's like one book and chaos plus, you know, a bunch of things in the launch of this physics project. So it's a little different from, from the normal things that happen in science. Why were we able to do that? Basically because we have a new paradigm for thinking about things computationally that could be applied to physics and hadn't been applied there. Um, and, uh, and I fault myself for not having pushed harder to apply it earlier, but that's a different matter. Um, and so, you know, this is what happens when you have a new paradigm that you can apply to something, there is the possibility. I mean, I didn't think it was going to be as easy as it's turned out to be, but there's the possibility that you really make, uh, you know, a jump of progress. And, and that's what's happened in this case. So it's a little different from, from sort of ordinary science in that respect. It's also different in that, uh, frankly, I, you know, my, uh, I'm not an academic. I don't make a living writing papers, for example. Um, and you know, the, the, the ecosystem in which I exist is, um, is one that has different value systems from, uh, from academia. And so I don't really have to, um, you know, it's, it's not something where, where, um, uh, where the kind of constraints of academia um, that have, a, I mean, I should say that the, the big feature of academia and is that it's big. And because it's big, it's institutionalized. And because it's institutionalized, it has a lot of specific tracks and constraints. Well, we don't have those issues. We're, it's not a big project yet. Um, it isn't part of that sort of institutionalized structure. Um, we're trying to use the best elements of that institutional structure. And hopefully, um, in fact, we know many people involved in that structure are sort of getting involved in this project but the project doesn't intrinsically live in that institutional structure. So we get to kind of reinvent a bunch of things. And uh, you know, the question is, okay, we're starting in the year 2020, how do we do science? Um, and uh, uh, it's not necessarily the same answer to how do we do science, you know, the, the, the history of science, I, I should say the history of meta science, of how science is done. Uh, you know, back in, in ancient Greek times, back in, in the, you know, a lot of science was done by philosophers, so to speak, and they wrote books and they would discuss how science should work and so on. Then, you know, 1600s, science got sort of more organized. There were the professional societies and scientific societies and so on. And things like scientific journals came into existence where people would report, I figured out this, I figured out that. I don't have to write a whole book to report what I'm reporting. I can just give you a bulletin about what happened. And you know, at a time when science was quite small, there were quite a small number of people, people probably most of the people who were in the business knew each other, and um, sometimes they couldn't stand each other, but that's a different issue. Um, the, uh, you know, they, it was a small group, and so things could be done. And, and then gradually science expanded, and, you know, science got applications in engineering, technology, and so on. But then post-World War II, there was sort of this explosion in the side of, size of science. And, uh, you know, in... in um, and, and in the universities and so on, just it became this, this giant structure where you know, hundreds of thousands of people are doing uh, many of these areas of science. And there's a, there's a, you know, it's, it's a, a very structured thing. And um, you know, a lot of the, the current idea of, oh, you know, scientific journals, peer review, 
all these kinds of things. They're they're pretty modern ideas actually, um, and uh, you know they're they're pretty and they you know there've been gradual refactorings that have happened. Um, you know things like well the notion of preprints, preprint servers, preprints predated preprint servers. Back when I was in the physics business, one used to get by mail, um, you know by physical mail. Um, one used to get um, you know copies of papers before they would come out, and then you know. Uh, my friend Paul Ginsberg made this thing called Archive, which is um, uh, this sort of online version of the of what used to be the sort of preprint mailing ecosystem. Um, but uh, you know, then there are these kind of notions about what constitutes a a sort of a a way to make progress in science. What's the unit? What's the minimum viable unit of scientific progress? Oh, it's a paper. It's a paper that works this way. It's a paper that has to be incremental because it's a paper that has to have certain characteristics that fit into this kind of fabric that's been built for the way science works. Okay, so how should we do this? You know, what, how should we, in 2020, how should this work? So for example, the idea of kind of letting people in on the, on the process of science being done with our live streams and so on, it's something that, in a sense, we experimented with things like that with the live streams we've done for software design for the last couple of years, and it's worked really well there. It's been really, really useful to us in terms of software design, and I think it's been informative to lots of people. Um, so we thought, let's let's do that for this. It's kind of let people in on the science being done, because then they can participate, be helpful, and uh, it's also hopefully interesting. And and perhaps some, uh, perhaps for some people, particularly sort of students and so on, it's perhaps uh, perhaps if they like what they see, it's like okay, this might be a, something you could do. Um, the um, so uh, and. Uh, you know, I think that the notion of um, the, the other big thing for us is providing software tools immediately. I mean, you know, a lot of times you read a paper and it's like, okay, uh, let me try and understand that. Let me see if I could implement that. Oh, I don't really understand it. There must be some assumption they're using I don't understand. Let me email the author, or let me, um, uh, or let me just give up. Or, um, but the whole idea here is that we're writing things where, we, you know, we we've got the code exists, and not only does the code exist, if I want to know, you know, if Jonathan or Max, you know, or someone is is producing something um, and says, this is how this works, it's like, well, let me see the piece of code. Because even if your words I don't really understand, I can understand the code. And that's what happens by having this computational language that we have. It's a language intended for humans to read as well as machines to understand. And so it's a, it's a communication medium that works human to human as well as human to computer. And that's an important piece to this. So that's another element of this whole story of sort of open science is let's have the tools be accessible to anyone. So, you know, we'll make, we make notebooks from our live streams and things. They're immediately posted. Anybody who wants to go and explore from that, the tools exist. They can run that code. They can just do the, do the things we're doing and extend from that. Now, you know, how this ecosystem develops, I don't completely know. You know, there are questions about, um, uh, uh, there are a bunch of questions, but you know, we're, we're, we're trying to reinvent this in the best possible way uh, without some constraints that have, have existed elsewhere that we don't happen to have for, for, for you know, coincidental reasons. Um, and, uh, but gives us the opportunity to experiment in the doing of science as well as the content of the science. Um, okay, so there's a com com uh, comment from Lucas on the subject of ancient philosophy. You're doing something called Indra's net in ancient Buddhism, the net of causality. That's interesting. I don't know about that. You know, one of the things we were thinking of doing a live stream actually about sort of theological philosophical ideas. Um, I've been surprised at how little uh, sort of Theological thought has has been you know has been kind of been been being presented with because a lot of the questions we're asking about you know how the universe fundamentally works are questions which did get think thought about by by philosophers and by theologians and you know before uh, you know before a few hundred years ago particularly you know most philosophy was interwoven with theology. Um, and so, for example, one of the questions that I would really love to know the answer to, okay? So, so I've been puzzling for a long time, why this universe and not another? 
And I think I kind of feel comfortable with the answer. There's only one possible universe. We are merely seeing our particular slice that we understand of that one possible universe. But now the question is, why is there any universe? Why does the universe exist at all? Why is there not nothing? And you know, we can say there is an abstract set of constructs that those constructs make a universe, as in, it's like you know, two plus two makes four, abstractly. You don't actually have to have two counters, another two counters, and put them together and make four counters. Abstractly, we can say that two plus two is equal to four. So similarly, we can abstractly say that given these underlying rules and so on, abstractly represented, we don't have a concrete version, there's no computer bits running it, just abstractly these rules, they will unfold to make our universe. Um, so now the question is, the fact that those rules exist in the sense that you can imagine constructing them is not, does not give you a way to say that those things exist as an actuality. So for example, in one you know, theological analog of this is Spinoza's statement, I think it came from people much earlier than him, but um, you know, the universe is, is kind of the, is a, is a representation of the thoughts of God. So that's, you know, that, that's couched in a, in, a, in a sort of terms different from maybe the terms we would use today or some people would use today, but that's kind of a, an understanding of there is, you know, there is some, this is the universe is the actualization of something abstract. And so the question is, why is there an actualization? Why does, you know, why, why is there, and I really I, I sort of I, emboldened by thinking that I actually have some understanding now of why there's only one universe. I have been thinking a little bit about that. I, I think I may have mentioned, I mean, my, my one sort of pseudo thought about that is this question of why does the universe exist? Um, okay, so in mathematical logic, uh, Gödel had his first incompleteness theorem that said that the, uh, there were statements in arithmetic that were independent of the axioms of arithmetic. You couldn't describe, so, uh, but then the second incompleteness theorem says that, that that theory cannot establish its own consistency. So in other words, from within the theory, by using the axiomatic structure of that theory, you cannot establish the consistency of the theory. So the thinking, the analogy is maybe it's the case that from within our universe, you can never establish sort of why the universe exists. And I don't have a precise version of this, but the kind of meta idea is that, that it might be the case that you can make arguments, but that somehow that statement of why the universe exists, just like the big surprise of Gödel's theorem was showing that the statement, this statement is unprovable, could be compiled into a statement about arithmetic. It could be compiled into a statement about equations with integers and all that kind of thing. So similarly, the question that I would ask is, can the statement, um, well, what would be the right version of it? Uh, more or less the statement, why does this universe exist? Or, uh, uh, you know, it's nice to have one of these things where you can actually have like Gödel's statement, this statement is unprovable, uh, kind of had a, uh, had, a, had a paradoxical character to it. There's, there might be a version, maybe somebody can suggest it, there might be a version of the why does the universe exist that can be stated in terms of a paradox or a seeming paradox. And then the question is, can we compile that question into something that is answerable by the computations that go on in our universe? And if we can show that that question is uncompilable into the constructs that exist in our universe, we've shown that that thing is, is inaccessible to us in the same kind of a way that if we, were, if we were creatures that lived in the piano axioms of arithmetic, then knowing the consistency of our axiom system will be unreachable to us. We would be able to, you know, we could have our philosophers of, you know, our arithmetic philosophers, so to speak, debate to their heart's content about, you know, I believe uh, our system is consistent. I believe it's not consistent and so on. I believe there exists a, uh, a whatever outside of our system, but they would never be able to figure it out. You know, they would be stuck 
it's kind of like the flatlanders stuck in two dimensions and they, they can't imagine the, that, you know, that third dimension seems like something very different. Um, so similarly, you know, living as creatures inside this axiomatic system, inside the axiomatic system of piano arithmetic, for example, you might never be able to establish, you would never be able to establish its consistency. So similarly, it might be the case that living within our universe, we might be able to prove that we can never establish why the universe exists. And it might be the case that we could say, imagine that we had a hypercomputer, just like we can say, imagine that we can go beyond the piano axioms and say, we're gonna add new axioms to arithmetic. Imagine we could do that. Well, then we could do all, all kinds of things. But um, uh, you know, we might similarly be able to say, imagine we could add a hypercomputer to our universe, then we could answer the question why the universe exists. We would have definite answers. Probably the answer would be, well, we could add a hypercomputer that would say why it exists in this way or say why it exists in this way. But because that is inaccessible to our universe, we can never establish that. So that's my, actually, I've gotten a little bit further in describing it to you all than, than I had before. So thank you for the, thank you for the implicit um, extraction of ideas here. Um, so, there's a question here about oligons being observables or beables. I, I, I mean, I think oligons are just a type of particle. Um, and uh, I'm being told I should wrap up soon. So let me just see. We've just got a few more questions here. Um, ba, 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 ba. There's a question from Jay here. Is the summer school something you would have attended back in the day? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I did. Um, when I was in the physics business, I went to, actually only really one, I went to a summer school. I know when I went because it was 7777. So, and I happened to notice that. So, so um, uh, and yeah, it was very, um, uh, it, it's really, a, 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 you know, the answer is yes. Um, Okay, there's a question from Matt here. How does Wharton decide how and when to publish reviews submitted on its private site? So you mean things like peer review things? Well, we're gonna put everything out there. I mean, the, the idea is whatever is submitted will be published. And the idea is, so, so one of the questions is, um, how do you review the reviewers? And so what we've invented is a scheme for essentially reviewing the reviewers that's based on exposing certain features, reviewers, uh, you know, providing, I don't know why I'm thinking about the immune system and tagging things, but anyway, a bad analogy, sorry. Um, you know, uh, reviewers are sort of exposing certain aspects of themselves. You know, are you a physics professor? Um, you know, are you an academic? Are you, you know, whatever, do you have an ORCID uh, ID? You know, are you whatever, these kinds of things. You know, are, do you have, so they're exposing those attributes. And the idea is that every review is published, but um, people can choose to look at reviews that are by reviewers that they are interested in the opinions of. Because kind of the, the concept in a sense of sort of the, the good concept of peer reviewing, I, I'm afraid it, it, it goes bad quite quickly, but the good concept is, can you create a chain of sort of, of, of trust between you and the thing that you're trying to look at. In other words, could it be the case that you know so-and-so who knows so-and-so who can vouch for that thing? It kind of reminds one of old fashioned, you know, letters of credit or something in the, in the old fashioned or, or something, these, these uh, kind of very ambassadorial ways that, that um, things would happen in international trade back in the day. Maybe they still happen, I'm not sure. It seems simpler these days. Um, but in other, in other words, where it's sort of a human to human to human uh, transmission of of sort of the, the trustworthiness or credibility of ideas. That's a good version of this. And then, you know, if you're confronted with, if, if a particular person that you actually know wrote one of those reviews, then great. Then it's like, you don't have to ask that person, what do you think of this? Because they just wrote one of these things. But at least it might be a person with an attribute that is one that would cause you to say, oh yeah, that person will know what they're talking about, or that person will have opinions that will be useful to me. Um, so let's see. Okay, it looks like that's about it for today. And I've gone way over time. And um, I got a, this is my problem is, is that it's sort of a computationally irreducible process. Um, what, what ends up getting coming up and being said and, and, and the ideas that come out. 
um, in, these, uh, in these sessions. Um, I'd like to remind people, uh, yes, okay, we've got a couple of other live streams coming up uh, tomorrow, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm doing another one of my weekly Q&As for kids and others. And I think I'm continuing my topic uh, from last week, which was, what's the real story behind ideas from science fiction? So if we think we know how physics ultimately works, we should be able to address whether those ideas from science fiction will work or not. Not as easy as it sounds, but um, I'll do my best. And then uh, coming up early next week, Tuesday, we have a discussion with Faye Dauka, who's a physicist in the UK, um, who uh, is one of the creators of the field of causal sets. Actually, she'll probably be joined by another one of the creators of the field of causal sets. Um, and uh, causal sets are something that we're interested in and, and are very relevant to our models. Um, and we'll probably be talking about um, the theory of reference frames and so on, a bunch there. Um, anyway, encourage people. And I, I think uh, uh, we'll, um, uh, um, don't know how physics technical it will get. I know if we inject computation, I'm pretty sure our physics friends will be, um, uh, will not be familiar even with the, well, uh, hopefully they'll, I was going to point this out actually, that, that the, um, the, the relationship to distributed computing is something we may want to discuss there. All right, well, thank you all very much for, for um, coming and uh, look forward to uh, interacting with you all in the future on another live stream or at our summer school. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.